topic for the night is we first begin things off with the Detroit Pistons who have now officially tied the Philadelphia 76ers for most consecutive losses in a row. The Pistons have now lost 28 games in a row after losing to the Boston Celtics tonight, 128 to 122. The Pistons were able to tie the game in the last final seconds of regulation before going into overtime and getting outscored 20 to 14. On Tuesday night during Nets game, fans were chanting sell the team as the Pistons also fell to the Brooklyn Nets. Guys, with the Pistons losing 28 straight now, will this team be on the wrong side of history after Saturday night? And do you guys think they might actually hit the all-time most losses in a season with 73 or more losses, which was done by 76ers in the 1973? Chris, take it away. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, like they 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 look awful. Um, like for them, like I don't know. It just it just goes from bad, bad to worse, and I I mean, like it's hard to even see them winning a game at this point. Um, they're by far the worst team in in um, in the NBA right now. Let alone worst, maybe worst team in history. Uh, as far as like selling the team, I think that's too too early to say say that. Um, I mean, Detroit Pistons they are they are a great franchise. Uh, there's some rich history there. Um, you can't forget about the Bad Boy Pistons from from the 80s and early 90s, um, and as well as the the Pistons team that beat that that stacked Lakers team back in I think it was like 03 and 04, right? They they went as underdogs. Um, but right now they're just they're they're they are they are big mess. Um, it's just one of those situations that you just got to kind of like clean house and just kind of refigure things. Um, but as far as like getting rid of the, rid of the team, uh, it's too too early to say that. They they haven't had like. I mean, like if if this continues, <laughs> if it, if it continues this way in the next couple of years, I mean, yeah, then you have an argument for that. But like right now. It's it's one year. It, it looks nasty, yeah. And as a fan, it's very discouraging, very disappointing, frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, there's it's just mixed emotions right now. Um, the goal the goal as a fan is you want to see your team win, and to to see like no hope in your team, it's it is a frustrating situation. Uh, looking at this team though, I mean, like realistically, I know there's a lot of basketball left to play, right? But I, I just don't see them. They might win like a game or two here or there. That's if, if, um, I, I don't I, I can see them easily losing like every single damn game. Like they're that bad. They're that bad. Um, yeah, they're definitely going to break that record though. <laughs> they're going to go down as probably the worst team in history. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty bad, dude. Uh, I mean, when you talk about, when you, when you talk about like the, the 76ers from 19, what was it? 1973, where they only won like nine games in the whole season. Like, that's that's bad. Um, that's bad. And right now they they literally only have what is it like two wins right now? Like they're like two and something right now. Uh, yeah. And they're pretty bad. Um, I, I believe they started the season off like two and one, and I remember everyone commenting like, "Oh, they're, this is a young team, and this team's probably going to be one of the favorites to come out of the out of the East." And I was like, "Guys, like pump the yeah. brakes, like yeah. relax. that didn't age well. Like, <laughs> that didn't age well at all. <laughs> we're barely like." three games into the year, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, but, but you're seeing it now, you know, so, yeah, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's sad because that team is young and they have a lot of promising talent, um, yeah. but they, they look, they look awful. And I think part of it too, is they do have a lot of young players and I've always said like, yeah, you have all these draft picks and you're going to draft a lot of great promising talent, mm -hmm. but you can't, you can't win a championship through the draft. Like, you have even like when the Warriors draft, like when the Warriors won their championship, they still had like certain veterans on their team. You know, like mm -hmm. they got their main core through the draft. They got Clay, Steph, Draymond, all through the yeah. draft, but they still had players like Iguodala, Sean Livingston, um, Leandro Barbosa. Like, yeah, they were later into their careers, mm -hmm. but they were still like veterans. You know, mm -hmm. um, versus like the Pistons, like they're just young all over. I mean, I think like Bart. 
I forgot how to say his last name, like Bardonovich or something like that. Like he's a veteran, but you need more, you know? Um, so yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of promise there in, in Detroit, but they have to get, they have to get players through free agency to kind of help them, you know, uh, especially like veteran players. Um, but uh, the fans, I don't know, like it's Detroit, you know, of course they're going to be <laughs> tough for fans, you know, but yeah. at the same time, like they need to just kind of be a little bit patient here. If they're going through the growing pains, you know, um, not everybody can be a Boston Celtics or a Los Angeles Lakers or a Warriors, you know, yeah. you guys, I mean, everybody has to kind of go through those growing pains, even like, Golden State had to go through the growing pains as well, you know, um, and and they did. So um, even like the Boston Celtics before they got the big three, um, I think they only won like 18 games that, that year. Yeah. So it, it happens to the best of them. Yeah, it, it takes time to build a, a franchise for sure. Um, and like I said, they're they're extremely young um, and, and they'll get there, you know, they'll they'll get yeah. there. Uh, I'm not going to say – I know, like, some people are saying they should fire Monty Williams, but, I mean, the dude – the dude's a, a decent coach. You know, he's not the worst coach in the league. Um, not only that, but you just signed him to, like, a like a big max contract. What was it, like, a seven-year contract or something like that? So, I mean, you're kind of stuck with him. They're not going to just get rid of him in, after not even a full se- – not even half a season yet, you know? Um, and like I said, like, like – Who are you going to get to take his place? Yeah, now? it's like, like – Anybody, can, you could put one of the best coaches and and on that team, and and they're still gonna be, they're they're still not gonna be great only because they're so young. Like they're going through those growing pains. You know, it's gonna take them time to to grow. Um, like Kate, like Cunningham is is a promising player. That right. is one promising player. You know? So, um, yeah, I think that Detroit fans just need to be a little bit, little patient right now. Um, but it it's obviously not a good start. But the thing with them is, like, there's still a lot of ways to go throughout the year. And do I think they're going to break that record of losing more than 28 games in a row? Because now they've already lost their 28th game. Probably. Um, <laughs> because, like, when you look at their schedule, like, I mean, they got to play the Raptors. What is it? They got to play the Raptors next, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's going to be – that's going to be – kind of tough in itself <laughs> um and then after that they got to play a pretty decent rockets team they're not horrible you know um but i mean yeah i mean they're kind of on the verge of losing at least the next <sighs> well i mean if, if there's ever a chance to to win it would be either saturday or monday because after that it's literally it's pretty much hell for them for the next couple games because they got to play Golden State, the Nuggets, and the Kings. So uh, that, that's tough. It's rough for them. Um, I do think they'll probably be the first team to lose 29 straight games in a row, um, and I wouldn't be shocked if it was more. Uh, will they hit the record from the 73 Sixers? That's a little I – don't, I don't know if they'll hit that. Um, I that's tough, tough, dude. Yeah. I mean, when you that think about so like, basketball, winning only nine games out of an eighty-two game season, like that doesn't yeah. even seem like it would be, <laughs> like that would even happen in today's era, you yeah. know. Um, but damn, damn, I don't know. Like they're they're just like I said, they're so young and they're and they're bad, you know. Like there's a lot of promise, but they're so bad right now, you know. Um, there's, there's no direction over yeah. there. Yeah, like you said, they're they're all young. There's just no there's no leadership. They they do need like a couple of veterans to kind of, you know, yeah. So somebody to um kind of mirror off of, you know what I mean? Like they they need um they need some experience. They just don't have it. They don't have it at all. Yeah, they're I I I'm not gonna, I'm not ready to say that they're going to hit that only 9 game win in a in a whole season. Mm-hmm. I I feel like they might get over 10 10 wins this year. I do feel like they will get there, but to sit there and say that they're gonna win only nine games or less, like I I know they're bad, but I don't I don't know if they're that bad. Like I mean, when I think about it, like could they beat a team like the Raptors? Absolutely. Can they beat a team like the Jazz? For sure. You know. Uh, yeah. Can they beat teams like like the Wizards? Absolutely. Can they beat teams like the Spurs? For sure. Uh, you know, like I mean, those are some teams I can see them winning against. You know. Um, but I don't know. Like, 
tonight was kind of frustrating because they had an opportunity to beat the Boston Celtics and they literally kind of choked it away tonight. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, – after watching, you know, like, their best chance tonight to win was in regulation and they, they obviously didn't do it, you know. So, um, in overtime, I, they, I felt like they're just a team that's not really meant for – to to play in overtime like you could tell they're kind of uh they were kind of gassed by that point you know mm -hmm. um, i thought for sure like when they when they hit that game tying shot that they would have a opportunity like because you kind of saw boston's demeanor kind of go down after that little almost a buzzer beater by the by the pistons to, to force overtime so yeah. i kind of felt like boston's demeanor go down but um but you can tell that they were that the pistons were kind of just worn down and mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's, it won't be easy, but I, I do, I am going to say that they will, they will win more than 10 games. I can't see them being under, under nine. There's just no, no way, not in today's, yeah, not in today's it, era. You know, I just, I don't see it. Just too much. There's too much basketball left. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it, it's, it's possible, <laughs> but at the same time, like you said, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to believe. Because there is, when you look at like on paper, there is teams that are that are worse than them. Like the Wizards would be considered worse than them, right? Even with the, even with those big names that they have there. Yeah, they're just they they. Um, <laughs> when you think of the Wizards, they're just they're just a complete mess. Mm -hmm. um, with even with all that talent, there's just no there's no chemistry there. I feel like they just pieced a bunch of players together just to hope for something to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, at least with Detroit, like you said, they're young. We're, we're still yet to figure out these players. This is like a lot of them. This is like their first or second year. Yeah. So, I mean, the future could be bright for them. I, you go toe to toe with like the number one team in the league and you go to overtime because Boston is like the number one team right now. Yeah. Um, that, that, that already right there kind of shows you promise that they could go toe to toe with the best of them. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, they didn't pull off the win. That would have been huge for like motivation going forward. But mm -hmm. the fact that you didn't pull off the win is still kind of deflating. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like you said, like just looking at something like that, you can't see a team like that breaking that record of you know having the most <laughs> the most losses. So it's my take on it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's tough, um, and it's it's deflating because they've had a couple games like where where they were close to, to kind of winning, you know? Um, yeah. I think it was kind of harsh for the fans to kind of chant, like, sell the team. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think I think what they're meaning by that is, like, when they sell the team, like, not completely get rid of, like, their team. I think they're, they're talking about, like, sell ownership, you know, like, get rid of these yeah. GMs and bring in people who actually give a rat's ass, you know? Um, and I, 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 may, I that's how I kind of interpreted it, unless they're – chanting like literally like sell the team like in terms of like get rid of just the Detroit Pistons like completely I don't think you would want to do that because like there's just so much like history behind the Pistons you know yeah exactly. um, the way I kind of saw it was like they were just chanting like get rid of these GMs get rid of like basically what more teams should probably do you know um especially teams that are like that haven't been relevant for years um but it, it's like I said in the past like if you want change like stop supporting the team stop yeah stop going to stop going to the games like they these owners aren't going to care if <clears throat> they don't care to build a winning a winning team if mm -hmm. if you're constantly buying their products you're buying uh stuff to support them and you're buying tickets to go to their games like you know you're watching their games on television like they get they obviously get money for all that stuff, you know? So it's like, if you want change, stop buying, stop buying hats, stop buying uniform, uh, stop buying jerseys, uh, <laughs> stop buying uh, tickets, stop watching the games on TV, do yeah. that. They'll see their, they'll see their, their, their money start dropping. That's when they'll, that's when they'll start caring. But exactly. until then, like, I mean, why would, if you're an organization, it's like, why would you want to, why would you want to work twice as hard to build a winning culture? If like, you're just going to make money no matter what, you know? Yeah. So it's like, I mean, why, why put all that stress on yourself, you know, like when you don't have to, because you know, people are going to support no matter what. That's, mm -hmm. 
kind of what I've always said. Um, me, you see it with other, with like, you know, like teams, like other teams, like, like Niners, like Niners, for example, like when that was, that was actually kind of a perfect example. Like the Niners for a long time were horrible mm -hmm. and like that stadium, like it wasn't as filled as it used to be, you know? And then once they started, I, I don't know, like once they started like, uh, do like doing that, like the fans started doing that. Then that's when, you know, they started, uh, Making kind of just started making changes exactly um so yeah, that's kind of my take on it but i i don't see really detroit doing that anytime soon uh maybe it is a start by them by them chanting that you know that is kind of that is kind of a start yeah. you know um they're, they're just sick and tired of being sick and tired it's like it's it's bad enough that the the team hasn't been in contention for a while like yeah they, they've been in the playoffs here and there but at this point it's just like it went from bad to worse mm. like this team is just not even not even relevant at this point yeah they and and there was a point like where the pistons actually looked like i want to say it was back in 2011 or two i think it was like 2011 mm -hmm. where the pistons actually looked like they were like they were young but they were like kind of up and coming again you know like there was a little bit of promise there and i don't know what happened you know um yeah and the Pistons kind of have to get back to that, you know? Um, when you think of the Pistons, I mean, you think of history, you know? Um, this hasn't worked out for them in the past, so. Mm -hmm. um, or recently, I should say, not the past, but recently. So, I mean, something's got to change, and maybe maybe it will, but you could tell it was just deflating tonight because they knew they had oh, yeah. they had an opportunity, and they just they fell short, and that sucks. You know, it's like, you could tell, like, those those young players want to win. Like you can see it on their faces. Like I can't believe that like, we're gonna be like this first team that like you don't. There's rec there's records you want to break, and there's records you don't want to break. You know, and yeah. they're on, they're on the they're on the verge of of breaking one this upcoming weekend. So especially if they lose and it's deflating, and you can just see it on their faces. They're just you know I feel I, I basically what I'm saying is like I feel bad for them. You know, but for those players, you know, because. You could tell yeah. a lot of them. A lot of them do care. So, um, yeah, it's it sucks, dude. Yeah. According to Sports Illustrated, the Minnesota Vikings are better favorites to land Broncos quarterback Russell Wilson this off season. Russell, who was signed to a five-year, two forty-two point six million dollar contract back in twenty twenty-two has now officially been benched by Broncos head coach Sean Payton. The Broncos are expected to release Wilson this offseason. Guys, do you see Minnesota as a probable stop for Wilson next season? Mm, the, the, the Vikings? Mm -hmm. The Vikings, yeah, I, I, I can see, uh, I can definitely see him that would actually be kind of an ideal fit for him. Um, I actually think he could be actually be a really good fit with the Minnesota Vikings, especially with like the young talent that they have there, like especially uh, Justin Jefferson. Like I oh, feel yeah. like that would be a good fit. Um, now I will say this: like if if Russell Wilson goes there and then like tanks again, oh, and, sure. you know what, how. We always say it, crap the bed, you know. Mm -hmm. um, if he craps the bed there, then it's like, <laughs> you know, he could – any other opportunity, he would. He probably never would get an, another opportunity ever again. Um, yeah. How could you give a guy another chance? Like, if he literally went to Denver, it was disastrous, and he goes to the Vikings and it doesn't work out. Like, I feel like that would just kind of be the beginning of the end of Russell Wilson, you know. Uh, I do think that he would be a really good fit um, with a young core like that. Um and just kind of the style of play that the Vikings kind of play with, I think he would, he would kind of fit right in. Um, I, like I said, I, I don't see him fitting with uh, Sean Payton's system. You know, I could see yeah. him fitting in that Minnesota system a lot more than I do see him with, with Sean Payton. You know, um, I already gave my take last night on who I think the Broncos should go after. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I think that would be a really good fit, um, but. I mean, I still think Russell Wilson still has a lot to offer, but yeah, it's it's definitely the end um, in in Denver for sure. Um, 
Yeah, that's, that's Every, done. <laughs> it's, it's done. Like, there's no – I mean, knowing that there's still that 1% chance that you can make the playoffs, like, it's – I mean, why would you – why would you even – if you know you can still have a possibility of making the playoffs, why would you take out your starting quarterback and put a backup in? You know, that, that, that alone tells me that you're done, you're over it, and mm-hmm. you've given up all hope, not only on your quarterback but on the season, you know. So, yeah, um, yeah uh, there's a couple teams, I think, Russell Wilson would fit in. I think Minnesota is definitely one of them. I think LA would be another one. Uh, the Giants would be another perfect mm-hmm. example, uh, place for him to land. Uh, possibly even somewhere like uh, like Washington. You know, Washington would be a good fit too. Yeah. Um, but there's a couple places. But I think for him specifically, the best fit would be Minnesota. Like out of all the locations that Russell Wilson can be, I think Minnesota would be perfect. No, I. Agree. Um, we already saw what that offense looks like with uh, Kirk Cousins, even with uh, Josh Dobbs. Like they're explosive. Uh, they can they 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 can hold their own. Uh, we saw we saw the matchup with the Niners. They gave the Niners a loss, and you know that's that was considered like the number one team at the time. Um, they did fairly well in their division. Um, obviously, you know, it, it's it's kind of hard to take on take on Detroit because they're they are like one of the top three teams in the NFC right now. So minus that, they they've done well against like the Bears. They've done well against Green Bay. Um, they've done well, like period, just for what the pieces that they have. Um, and then injuries as well. Like Justin Justin Jefferson has been out for like a majority of the season, and they were still pull, like finding ways to win. So you know, like you said, you had you had a guy like Russell Wilson in there, and all of a sudden that kind of like that changes that team around and makes them a, a contender again. Mm-hmm. And, and um, honestly, I think he's just like, we saw, we saw what Kirk Cousins was able to do with that team. Um, a guy like Russell Wilson, he's more mobile. So he gives you more options. You know what I mean? So if you're not airing it out, if you're not dishing out to your running back, you got to worry about Russell Wilson running. So like that just that just adds another element, another factor for that team. Mm-hmm. So honestly, it makes them probably to me probably um, like the second best in in that division. Mm-hmm. So I'm still gonna put Detroit because you still got to prove you got to beat Detroit to to take that top right. contender. Right. But I, I do think that's gonna be a place where he kind of like revitalizes his career briefly. Um, like you said, Broncos just they were just a hot mess and to put that on anybody to try to like rebuild whether whether it was russell wilson or sean payton um it's it's something that was going to take a couple of years and it's not an overnight process and um unfortunately russell wilson had two years to do that and somebody has to be the fall person so starts with the quarterback and then obviously if they keep tanking in the next couple of seasons or next year uh, it's probably gonna be sean payton so right um, yeah, but- no be another yeah that would be another so, case but, for sure. but i agree like, like if he can't make it happen in minnesota then yeah that's that's the writings on the wall it's the beginning of the end mm-hmm. uh, we're kind of seeing it with uh Derek carr as well i mean he did he did okay but it's still the same Derek carr he can't he can't finish strong when it matters and then still injury prone um that kind of like that lowers your stock value you know what mm-hmm. i mean um, not only that, but you're getting older. Mm-hmm. So the, these these uh, these teams, they want to win, and they want to win now. Yeah. Um, they they're not going to put all this money into you, and you're just like you're you're a maybe player, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, right. uh, a shell of your, shell of your past. So um, I I think it's gonna be a good fit. I do think it's gonna be a good fit. So uh, I'm actually excited to see if that does happen. Excited to see Russell Wilson playing. In, in that purple uniform. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be not only that, but Russell Wilson needs a fresh start somewhere, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think the whole situation with uh, Kirk Cousins, too, like, like, I think they need to move on from him, yeah. you know? And if they move on from him, they have to go after somebody because obviously, obviously, Josh Dobbs wasn't your answer. You know, the Josh Dobbs story is, is officially over. Um, he's a good backup. It'd be a he's good a good backup. backup. Backup, you know, you could definitely keep Josh Dobbs as your backup, but he's definitely not a. At first, I thought he was kind of like a, a potential starting quarterback. You know, like he was, he actually like was con, like, 
he was in Arizona and he made some pretty decent noise there in Arizona. And then he went over to Minnesota with, and then like within like four days had to memorize the whole playbook and actually literally did really well with the Vikings, you know, yeah. until it obviously came to an end. But um, I definitely think, you know, he's, he's a good backup and I, I would hope Minnesota keeps him as a potential backup. Um, I mean, he, like for a while there, he, he was making a case like he was a potential starting quarterback, you know, yeah. uh, it was funny. Cause like, he was when he was in Arizona. He was wondering like, why aren't these places like having selling my jerseys and stuff like that? Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like it breaks a little bit there, dude. You're not, you're not a, uh, you haven't proven anything yet, you know, other than you're a decent backup, you know. Um, yeah. You weren't when you weren't even expected to play because nobody thought Kyler Murray was going to be out. <laughs> yeah, and then like the whole situation when he went to Minnesota, like he did really well for a while, and then obviously it came to an end. Um, and you kind of saw the Josh Dobbs story kind of fading away. And now you really don't hear about him again anymore. So, um, like, obviously you're going to have him as your backup. You know he's not your future starting quarterback. Um, that leaves you with the option of uh, Kirk Cousins. Like, do you want to continue I, Do you want to continue with Kirk Cousins moving forward? Or do you want to move on from him? And I think it's time to move on. He's been there more than enough, more than enough time to, to do something. And he He's not delivering anything other than he knows how to choke in the playoffs, you know? So, yeah. I mean, you have to move on from him. Um, I think it's time. And what better quarterback to go out and get or trade for, other, you know, than Russell Wilson. It, that would be a perfect fit for both parties. Russell Wilson goes there. He'll have some pretty good talent around him. And they're getting the Vikings themselves are getting a fresh start with a new quarterback. I think that would make Justin Jefferson happy because you have to remember he's on a, what was it, like a rookie contract still. So, when yeah. when his contract comes up, he's gonna want to get paid, like, and he's gonna want to win. That's the thing with yeah. him. He's gonna he's going to want to win. And do you really think he can win with Kirk Cousins? Do you think he can win with Josh Dobbs? Absolutely not. Um, I think it would make him really really happy if they brought in Russell Wilson. Um, yeah. Now here's the thing, like I think he still has one more year on that on that rookie contract. So I guess it would just depend on how the two mend mm -hmm. next year. If 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 that's considering that Wilson goes there, um, if the two mend well and they mesh together pretty well, like you know, it, and Justin Jefferson's happy, he'll, I'm sure he'll he'll resign. Um, especially if he sees that there's an opportunity to to win a Super Bowl, you know. Um, well, you get a guy like, like Russell Wilson. That's like, why why wouldn't you want to stay? You know. I mean, unless you go to like a top contending team, like you get a chance to go to like the 49ers or Dallas Cowboys, or you get you get to go play with Aaron Rodgers over there in New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, I mean, if you had those options, then yeah, I could see the possibility to leave of leaving. But if not, you get a guy like Russell Wilson, and you get paid. Like it's a it's a win win. Why not stay? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, but here's the thing too. Like, I mean. Obviously, Justin Jefferson's probably kept up with Russell Wilson throughout the year. You know, he's probably kept mm -hmm. up with his career, and he's—he's—I'm sure he's aware of the situation in Denver. Um, like, who isn't? You know, so it's like yeah. if it ends up being the same situation it was in Denver, like, why would he want to resign to come back for that for another couple more years? Like, it, it wouldn't make, especially when you know you can get out and you can get out now. I guess the question would be more: Do you want to win or do you want to make money? And if you want to make money the options to stay in Minnesota. If you want to win and you haven't, and you and Russell Wilson aren't, are, aren't like meshing well together, like that's your chance to get out, you know, and go somewhere yeah. where you can contend for a Super Bowl, and you're most likely still going to make money too. So um, those are, I'm sure, things that Justin, Jeff Justin Jefferson himself will probably take into consideration. Um, but like I said, it would be a fresh start really for both parties. And I think, knowing that Justin Jefferson's rookie contract is coming up after next year, like I think it would, it's a step in the right direction of keeping, uh, keeping him there and keeping him happy mm -hmm. by showing that you're willing to make this move and bring in someone like Russell Wilson, who already does have a Super Bowl, you know? So yeah, um, he has that Super Bowl experience. He has a ring. Um, he's been there, he's been there twice, mm -hmm. one, one last one. So, um, yeah, it, I, I just think it'd be a, a perfect fit for both. I, I agree.
Two-time NBA champion Kevin Durant joined the Warriors back in July of 2016. <clears throat> After blowing a 3-1 lead to the 73-9 Warriors team, Durant would go on to win back-to-back -back titles against the LeBron James and the Cavaliers. Durant would come back for an extra session with the Warriors to try and three-peat, but ultimately would lose to the Raptors in 2019 after, after tearing his Archilles and Clay Thompson going down with an ACL, ACL tear. Durant since leaving Leaving the Warriors has yet to appear in a conference championship game. Meanwhile, the Warriors would come back three years later and win another championship. Guys, when do you look at KD's track record, do you guys think if he hadn't joined the Warriors that he would still not have any rings? Or do you guys think he would have won some? I think he would have got at least one with OKC. Because, I mean, when you look back at that 2016 season when Warriors had to come back from 3-1, mm -hmm. uh, even Draymond Green said when they lost the championship, they said it was actually the wrong team that went. He said OKC was probably the team that was, to, you know, to, be, to beat. Um, and he said OKC probably wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't choke that 3-1. Mm -hmm. And I agree. They, they were just, they were a really dominant team. Um, and I think you give them another season together, mm -hmm. just with that core that they, that they had. Um, I could see them winning at least one, maybe maybe two. Um, they they were they were pretty dominant. Um, I think the only um, new addition they had was like Stephen Adams, right? Mm -hmm. But besides that, and then they had minus James Harden, but still they they looked they looked great. Um, KD and I mean that was like prime KD and uh, Russell Westbrook and at the time when they were getting along, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, when you think of just those two together, that's like, <laughs> that's like straight up NBA jam right there. Like ideal players. Um, and then you had um, Serge Ibaka, which he was, he was a, another key, key player. Did they have Kendrick per Perkins at the time? No, huh? he's already yeah, been retired. Yeah. He wasn't even a factor anyway. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, I, I me personally, I think that they would at least got one, which they should have gotten that 2016 season. But I think they would have got one the next year had they stuck stuck together. Yeah, I I I think that uh, I do believe that OKC, you know, probably would have won one had they stuck together. Um, but I think they only probably would have just got one. I don't think they would have got multiple ones um, because you have to remember like. Teams like the Warriors were still there, you know, like they, they were, they were still there. Um, and I, but I do think that the Warriors probably would have fell short that that second season to OKC, um, because OKC would have had it out for Golden State after blowing a three-one lead. So yeah. I, I do think they would have gotten back there. Um, they had a lot of promise on that team, like you mentioned. They had, uh, they had like Stephen Adams still. They had uh, Kevin Durant. Uh, they had uh, Enos Cantor. Sergi Baca, uh, Anthony Morrow, who was an outside three-point shooter, um, Westbrook, Westbrook, Andre Roberson, like they had, they had talent on that team. Deion Waiters was another one too. Like they literally had talent on that team, and they just, they just honestly they just blew the lead, you know. Um, and and it happens a lot more. Ever since that's happened, it's happened a lot more. Like you see teams blowing like blowing 3-1 like, leads. leads like you see it a lot you know um they might not always come back to win the series but they they do come back to force a game seven so yeah um like it's it's more rare since that happened you mm -hmm. know um but yeah i do think that had had golden or had kevin durant not joined golden state they were going to win one that's why i say like I, I was shocked when he made the decision to leave i thought for sure he was probably going to opt into that to his year, I think he had like one year left on his contract. Yeah. He could have opted into, and he chose to opt out to go sign with the Golden State Warriors. Um, don't get me wrong, as a Warrior fan, I was excited. Like <laughs> we were, we welcomed KD with open right. arms. You know, uh, we were excited. I mean, you're talking about having like literally the at the time the best player on the planet on your team. Um, so yeah, I thought. I, I mean, I don't think he would have gotten two, but I do think he would have gotten one. Um, but I mean, there was other decisions that he probably could have made, you know, instead of going there. Um, yeah. he, got, he got slammed when he went to Golden State. Like, he got slammed. Uh, 
I mean, there were there. I mean, you got people like Stephen A. Smith who were saying like it was the weakest move by a superstar, which it really was. Like, it, honestly, it probably was because as bad as LeBron going to the Warriors or LeBron going to Miami was, like, at least he was going to a team that hadn't won it in a few years. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. he, he went to, yeah, he went and joined forces with Dwayne Wade, who already won one, but that was back in like 2000, well, 2006 or seven, and then mm -hmm. Chris Bosh, who was in his prime, but. He also wasn't – he hadn't won a championship just yet, he, and he hadn't even been to the finals. So, um, But when Kevin Durant joined the Warriors, it was like he was going to a 73-9 and nine team that literally dominated the league. And, and like, like I said, like, you lost to that team that beat you, you know? Uh, yeah. So it was kind of like a weak, a weak move. Like I said, like, it, it kind of was a weak move, but like I said, like, as a Warrior fan, like, I loved it. You know, I didn't care. Um, but there was other moves that he probably could have made. You know, he, he probably could have went to like, uh, could have stood in OKC for one. Um, I know there was talks about him possibly going with Pops to San Antonio. That was another one. Um, I think another one that was discussed was uh, was it like the uh, the Lakers? I think the Lakers were one. I, I believe. Um, I think that was like the hottest one. They were they were saying for the Lakers, and they were also talking about him going home to Washington at the time they had Bradley Beal and John Wall. So they were, that, they that were still kind of huge. huge yeah. That would have been huge, you know? Um, so those other moves, other moves that he could have made, you know, but he obviously went to Golden State, won two championships. Uh, I mean, championships are championships. Like you can't really not, can't really not count him, but you can, you know, cause he kind of needed Steph to help him win. Um, and yeah. where was the place? Where was the one place that you knew that you were guaranteed to win? That was to go to Golden State, and he wanted to win. So, um, I mean, when you when you think about all the the scenarios, like yeah, it was the smartest move for him, you know. Um, you but can't look, beat him, join him. <laughs> yeah, you can't beat him. Not as well join him, right? And now you're now you look at like you look at Durant. Now you're like, well, damn, he hasn't won since leaving. Like, it, so it obviously like makes you ask the question of like. Would he have won one without Steph and Clay and Draymond? Like, because he hasn't done it now, you know. Um, but I, I do believe he probably would have won. Like, I mean, you have literally Russell Westbrook as your team player, you know. But he, mm -hmm. he didn't think he could win with Russell Westbrook. So like, you can kind of see his argument there with it. Like, maybe they yeah. don't win in OKC, you know. Um, and he wanted to make sure like he had his championships before anything else. So, um, but yeah, I mean. Regardless, I, I still think he's one of the top, one of the best players of all time. Like, you know, you oh, can't yeah. have to doesn't have him take, doesn't take it away from him. Yeah. Exactly. Like, he's he's literally one of the best best players on the planet. So, um, can't take that away from him ever. But you can always kind of, if you wanted to, you, can, you could disregard his championships. You know, you could sit there and say, like, well, you need a Steph Curry to, to win a championship. So, we can't we can't put you in that type of conversation of, like, you know, like goat status or anything like that. He's definitely not that. Um, yeah. There's other players ahead of him, and like I said, the Warriors have won without him since. So um, true. true. And, I, and if I'm being honest, like I don't know if Kevin Durant will ever win another one. Like I honestly thought, like him going to Phoenix, like would have been probably his a, a best opportunity because now you're going. I thought he was gonna have Chris Paul. I thought he was yeah. gonna have Chris Paul again this year. You know, um, but it's kind of like a roster that he kind of wanted too. You know, like. Mm -hmm. You left, you left Golden State because you wanted to go to Brooklyn because you wanted to team up with Kyrie and you mm -hmm. wanted to kind of build your own team to show that you can win without Steph. That didn't work out. Now you're in Phoenix, and you kind of built this team around you so because you, you want to win, and it's still not working. So now it's like, yeah. well, now you have to start asking the question like, I don't know if Kevin Durant really will ever win another championship unless he were to go to like Miami or he were to go to like you know, Brooklyn or back to Golden State. I know there's like every year we hear the topic of is he gonna is he gonna go back to Golden State? Because I know he's even mentioned like I don't rule we don't you don't ever really rule anything out, you know. <laughs> so you you know um, I I don't I don't know if he'll ever go back to Golden State, but just the thought of him even mentioning it like I don't rule anything out, you know. It's just it kind of yeah you know like it it, it makes you kind of wonder a little bit, and you're always gonna have that conversation, you know. But um, who, who do you see? him going back back to first though if it did happen uh golden state or okc well he'll never go back to okc 
<laughs> they'll never go there. They hate him in OKC. They will never. It would yeah. see like the difference between this is like okay, LeBron left, but LeBron was born and raised in Akron, Ohio. Like that's where he's from. That's his home. So when he left, he got. I mean, obviously he got slammed, and he got. I know he got threats and all this stuff right when he left. But when he mm-hmm. came back, he, they. They weren't calling him names like Cupcake and, and you know, bashing him the way they, like, OKC fans were. Like, OK, yeah. OKC fans were, like, literally giving Durant death threats. Like, they would threaten LeBron, but they weren't death threats towards LeBron. No. These were, I mean, think about it. Like, they, these OKC fans were, like, giving Kevin Durant death threats. Like, think about it. It's just a basketball player. Like, get over it. You know, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. And like I said, like nothing, probably nothing's that serious, you know. But they hate Kevin Durant, and every time he still goes there, it's 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 still booze, you know. It's they don't, they haven't gotten over it, you know. They haven't forgotten, you know. They he left mm-hmm. his, I guess he we call him his little brother and Russell Westbrook. He just kind of left him hanging, yeah. And it was kind of like the way he left, you know, like the way he left OKC was kind of in the wrong. Like when LeBron left, at least there was like we all kind of knew he was looking to leave because when he lost to Boston and that I think it was in that game seven, we yeah. all already had the question of is he gonna leave, you know? Um, and you can kind of you can kind of see where where he was where he was gonna go. Um, but with with Kevin Durant, like we all knew he still had one year left on that contract, and we were all assuming like there's no way like. And then when you heard, heard like the conversation of like him potentially going to Golden State, you're like, there's no way he's going to Golden State. Like, he would get killed if he went to Golden State. Um, and then you started hearing conversations of, like, the the le- most landing destinations are between OKC and, and uh, and like, the Wizards. Like, like you know, like, yeah. we all kind of assume, like, we could see him going to Washington because that's where he's from. But what's in Washington? Like, yeah, you got John Wall and you got Bradley Beal, but you got two players that can't stay healthy. So, we were all kind of assuming he would stay with OKC because we all knew like OKC would probably be back that mm-hmm. following year. Um, and there was no warning. It was just like Russell Westbrook woke up in the morning and saw the news like Kevin Durant, like he didn't even contact him, nothing saying, hey, you know, I'm thinking of going to Golden State. It was like, I'm out. Like yeah. he woke up, saw the news. And I think everybody was shocked. I was shocked <laughs> when I woke up and I saw the, the breaking news, Kevin Durant going to the Warriors. I was just like, what? Like, I remember jumping up and down in my room. I was excited. <laughs> like, and, I mean, you know, I mean, Kev, I mean, Russell Westbrook, yeah, I mean, he woke woke up and saw that on the news. It's like, that's kind of like the wrong way to leave, you know? So yeah. they, they killed him in OKC. So I cannot see Russell Westbrook ever, or uh, Kevin Durant ever returning to OKC. I know he's mentioned, like, he... He sees like a like, like he 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 wants he would hope that OKC like kind of re- retires his number one day, but it's like they, they're not going to do that. Yeah, it's, it's not they happen. won't do that for you, you know. Oh, maybe Golden State will. I think Golden State will, but OKC. Well, if they ever get a an expansion team back for the Seattle SuperSonics, he would get that because that's where he actually started mm-hmm. before they turned to OKC. I don't even know if they'll. Do- that though either because i mean it, there's the, the two franchises are still gonna be kind of combined because those players all those players ended up going with okc yeah. so it, i i don't i don't even know if seattle would do that they they might because it is a different city yeah, it'd be a, it'd, but it'd be a, those, a, a lot of those fans transitioned in the okc fans because you know they had russell westbrook and kevin durant and all these guys so it i i don't I don't know if they would, um, and if they did, I don't think a lot of fans would really. I don't think they would really care because it's like you, you know you left us hanging, you know, kind of left yeah. us in the dust to go to that team that literally beat you, and I think that's what really aggravated a lot of fans. It wasn't that he left; it was where he left to. Because if he would have left to go back home, it it, it would have made sense. Like I'm going home to to Washington, you know, like it's my home. That's where I want to be. It's where I grew up. Like. So I think OKC fans would have understood that a little bit better versus let me go have the easy route and just guarantee a championship win. And that's to a team that literally just beat you like two months ago. 
So I think that's what aggravated a lot of fans, and that's why I don't think they'll ever really uh, welcome him back with open arms. Uh, like, Cavalier fans kind of got over LeBron, like, after the first year. They were kind of over it. Uh, yeah. And OKC fans, they, they haven't forgot. They, they, they definitely, uh, every time Durant walks in that arena, they let him hear it. So it, they still haven't gotten over it, and we're talking what? Almost set, almost six, seven years later, like yeah. they still haven't gotten over it, you know. So, um, I mean, because they know they missed out on the possibility of at least getting one. And yeah. I, I mean, I can't blame. Them. Yeah, I don't. I don't blame him. Like I said, it's just the way he left. It was just it was wrong, you know. I I agree, it was wrong, and I would probably be mad too if like think about it. We're Warrior fans. What if Steph would have left that way? Like, yeah. I'm gonna leave Golden State to go to go team up with LeBron in Cleveland, or I'm going to go team up with Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook. Like, you'd be like, what the hell, you know? <laughs> It'd be like a we, – we'd be aggravated too, especially yeah. if he would have left that way with no no signs of anything, and you're thinking that he's going to oh, yeah. just one day just ups and leaves. It's – yeah, I, I can see the reasoning. And I think Stephen A. Stephen A. Smith actually, like, said it best. It was uh, – how do you say it? It's almost like – like if you're like in a relationship and like you wake up the next morning, your girlfriend's just gone. You don't even know why. Like she just up and left. Everything was fine one day. And then the next day she just up and left you and never talked to you again. Like that's honestly messed up. Right. So that's how OKC fans kind of saw it, you know? So yeah, I don't, I don't blame them. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just gone bad from bad to worse for him. Though. And part, part of the reason is this, he's, he's not willing to make those like key moves like like other champion champions have done in the past yeah uh, which is you know taking a pet to build 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 around your team you know get some role players in uh he's asking for way too much and yeah. he's focused on just getting like those big names but yeah. i don't know it's just a hot mess <laughs> <laughs> all right guys and with that we're gonna get right to it uh we have an awesome guest right here with us i'm super excited to have him uh mr dylan uh i, I want to say it's adabu right yeah it's it's a babu okay. yeah yeah uh we appreciate you coming on with us tonight man we appreciate it um go ahead and let the audience know that's a little bit about you and who you are yeah so uh coach thomas uh thank you so much for having me uh, thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, so I'm I'm uh, I'm Dylan Ababu. I, I I played uh, in the Philippines uh, professional basketball for like eleven years, and then uh, yeah, so been playing basketball for like uh, thirty years, including childhood. <laughs> yeah, so now I'm in Chilari with my uh, family. That's awesome, and uh, I mean, tell uh, tell us just a little bit, like. Uh, when you played basketball, it was professional basketball, right? How long? How long did you play professionally? Yeah, so I played about uh, eleven years in the Philippines. Yeah, that's awesome, man. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations on that. I know how hard, I know. Like being a being a professional athlete, it's literally probably like one of the hardest things that you could possibly ever do. Am I am I right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard. You know, it's hard. It's. Uh, it's a serious sport, uh, you know, you have a responsibility to win and uh, yeah, you always need to play uh, very well or else uh, coaches will bench you. Not only bench you, but like, probably, <laughs> probably cut you from the team, right? They yeah. They don't, I mean, it's like an everyday grind, yeah. right? Yeah, it is. It, and it should be consistent, coach. Yeah. Chris, I'll, I'll let you answer one of the first questions that you might have for All Dylan right. himself. <laughs> what would you consider your greatest accomplishments as a basketball player? Uh, greatest accomplishment as a basketball player, uh, I would say I was able to play for the national team uh, almost all uh, all stages. So uh under 18 national team then uh, the young men's national team and then the men's national team and then uh, i was able to win uh 
uh, championships in in all levels except the the pros. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So I think that's uh, one uh, one great uh, blessing from the Lord. That's awesome. Uh, like so, because you obviously grew up in the Philippines, correct? Yeah. What was was what was life growing up uh, over there in the Philippines? Like, what was it like? Uh, in the Philippines, you know, uh, basketball is life there, and uh, everyone is like really like trying their best and dying to get a spot in a team. This uh, the Philippines is a third world country, so if you choose to uh, to uh, uh, play basketball, you need to really you know play professional in order to provide for your family. So it's kind of like hard, you know, it's cutthroat. Uh, a lot of uh, talent, but only few teams. So, a lot of focus and dedication needed. Nice. Uh, what mm-hmm. were like? I mean, you said you just mentioned right now. There was like very few teams. Like, how many teams are there? And like, how many teams like were you able to play for? Yeah. So in the professional rank, you only have twelve teams, and then I was able to play. Up, uh, I play with uh, I think eight or. Nine teams, so <laughs> so I was uh, kind of you know going around the league because uh, I was uh, I was always injured, so you know teams uh, trade traded me a lot, but uh, you know it's uh, uh, only twelve teams and there's a lot of talent, so it's hard, you know it's it's a uh, it's a hard league. Definitely, Chris, go ahead. I'll let you take this next one. So you, you played against like. Players like Kobe, LeBron. Um, what what was it like when you first got your chance to to like see these guys in person and play against them? Ah uh, yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, it was a huge huge blessing from the Lord. In 2011, there was an NBA lockout, so so the NBA legends were able to uh, to come and play there. Thank you to uh, to our boss uh, boss Manny V Pangilina and our sponsor for the national team for Smart. I was able to, you know, to invite the uh, NBA legends like Kobe Bryant, Kevin Durant, awesome. Chris Paul, uh, Derrick Rose. That was Derrick Rose's uh, MVP season. Uh, Derrick Fisher, Javel McGee, Tyreek Evans, even James Harden was wow. there. Uh, yeah, Derrick Williams. So a lot of NBA players. Le- LeBron came the next year, but uh, I wasn't able to... Uh, to participate because I had the uh, torn ACL in my knee, but uh, yeah, I was happy to see him in person. But uh, uh, yeah, a lot of NBA players, even uh, when when we when we played in Las Vegas for training, I think yeah, we had training at Las Vegas in two thousand and nine. We were able to play against Jeremy Lin, Lance Stephenson, Antoine Walker. So yeah, a lot of blessings uh, and a huge uh, you know. Huge experience to play against uh, NBA legends. Yeah, those are definitely a lot of NBA legends. Like being able to share the court, like with players like Kevin, like Kevin Durant, and like I mean, like the legendary Kobe Bryant. Like, right? What was that? What was a moment like that? What What did that mean to you? <laughs> it was a uh, for sure a once in a lifetime experience. So we tried our best to win. We tried to, you know pick up their brain, pick up their moves, uh, you know, because we can watch them up close and personal, you know, and how they move their feet, how they they make decisions. So we were like, we were like uh, uh, watching and playing with them. So it's like, uh, we were like courtside. <laughs> how, how hard was yeah. it? Like, how hard was it to like keep focus, like knowing that you're going against, I mean, like idols like that, like people grow up like wishing they could like I mean, just meet Kobe Bryant or meet Kevin Durant, let alone, like, you got to play against these guys. So, like, what was it like, like, having to, like, kind of keep your composure knowing that you're playing against these, like, legend players? Well, uh, we we just tried our best, you know, every possession. We just tried to to keep focus and play our best. And uh, like I said, mostly we, we tried our best to learn, learn the moves. And, uh, of course, we tried to win. We lost by nine points, and I think it's good. We we weren't blown out. <laughs> yeah, we we played as a team, you know. Uh, they were playing like an all-star game, so. Uh, but of course, they, they still tried to win. 
they don't want to lose against us, of course. <laughs> was was Kobe Bryant like trash talking on the court? Like, did you get to hear a little bit of that or? <laughs> no, no, he was he was really nice. You know, he was he was respectful, and then uh, he really played uh, like serious serious basketball. Uh, but you know, genetically they're strong and their core, their core really strong. We're trying to push them, but we can't. We can't move them. It's like they're pushing, <laughs> pushing a wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They they uh they didn't uh, joke around. You know, they yeah. they played the right the right way. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, who who yeah, was the, uh, who was the hardest to guard that night? <laughs> uh, uh, I would say James Harden because. James Harden is, uh, you know, uh, uh, I can't really explain. It's like his body type is like a mixture of a little bit of fats and muscle, so that's heavier, you know, compared to KD. Kevin Durant is lighter, you know, but he's seven foot. So uh, it's hard skill-wise. Kobe was strong, but James Harden was harder to push because of the combination of muscles and fats in his body. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, so it's heavier. <laughs> <laughs> this the, the the like the ball handling that he had too, like was like ridiculous. Like I couldn't even imagine like having a guard song like that on on a nightly basis, you know, like um but that's cool that you got to share that experience like with those those types of players because like you said, it's literally like a, a once in a lifetime opportunity and like nobody will really ever mm. maybe like one out of a million people even ever experience that so that's awesome that you got to do that um chris go ahead um my next question what what was the um uh, what was your greatest challenge you had to overcome in your in your basketball career uh greatest challenge uh my injuries so i had uh like like five surgeries uh two surgeries in my right knee uh and then another surgery in my nose uh one surgery on my ruptured achilles and then one more surgery so so a lot so it's hard because uh you know uh teams start started to you know to not get interested because i'm always injured so they they trade me around they they kind of pass me around uh that's the hardest because uh you know you, you try your best to uh because what happened to me personally, uh, you try your best to be in shape, and then now you're playing, you're playing, I think, uh, uh, pretty well, well, and then suddenly I get injured. So so it's always like the moment I feel like I'm on my peak already, where, where I reach my peak, peak of my performance. That's the time I get injured, so that's the hardest. And then you're going to have a surgery, recuperate, get stronger. Of course, there's a process because when you get back, uh, to the court, uh, there's a process. You, you don't feel 100% right away. And then when you reach the 100%, you're playing good, and then you get injured again. So mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the hardest challenge. Kind of like what happened to uh, Derrick Rose. Yeah. Uh, like, so, like, when you – like, when you were uh, – how young were you when you started playing basketball? I started there. Very, uh, very young. I would say six years old. Six years old. Uh, I I started basketball, and then at around ten years old, I was already uh, competing, like playing organized basketball, like competitions. So pretty, uh, pretty early. And when did you? So like when you started playing at six years old, like obviously, did you like you obviously fell in love with the game pretty soon? Yeah. Um, now, I guess my next question would be like. When did you realize, like, like I, I love this sport so much. Like, I, I want to, I, you know, like, I want to try and take my skills like the next level and I want to play professionally. Like, when did you make that decision? Yeah, around nine or ten years old, uh, whenever my friends ask me, what do you want to become when you grow up? I always tell them I want to play in the NBA. And they, of course, they'd be laughing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I always tell them. And uh, But, yeah. Like you said, I fell in love around that age, nine or ten years old, and then I really worked hard. I even, uh, uh, let's say, as far as I remember, uh, during summertime when there's no school, I play at like three, four p.m. or in 
the afternoon and then I end up seven in the morning. Almost, wow. Almost every day. During summer when there's no school. So imagine, uh, you start at 4 p.m. and then you end up seven in the morning. Of course, there, there's breaks, you know. I eat dinner, some snacks. But I end up seven seven in the morning. That's how dedicated I was before. But but you know, I don't want kids to be sleeping late. <laughs> that's my one of my advice. That's, that's really impressive. Um, wow, like that's great. Like starting at four and ending at seven. Um, what does like a for those that might not know? Because like obviously, like when you look at like the the basketball here, like for high school, for middle school, even college, like. I mean, the practices for high school are maybe like two or three hours long. Middle school practices are probably about anywhere between like an hour and a half long. Like, what's a professional basketball practice like? Like, what is a whole? I know it's not just. I know it's not just two hour practices. I mean, what does a, a full day of practice look like? Well, a full day of practice for 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 professional players. Uh, our team practices usually starts at 9, 9 in the morning. So that's 9 a.m. But we need to be there by like 6.30 or 7 to do our extra shooting, you know, some band work for our glutes. Uh, so we do it from like 6.30 to, I would say, uh, 7.30, you know, uh, band work, uh, shooting. And then from 7.30 to 8 in the morning, or 8.15, we do a lot of three on three, three against three. So so that, uh, uh, you know, we can develop our uh, uh, decision-making, read and react. And then at uh, after 8.15 or 8.20, we rest, you know, some take a shower, some eat some breakfast. And then we start team practice at 9. And then we end up, we end up at, at 11.30 or 12 noon. So that's team practice. And then after team practice, uh, we shoot maybe 30 more minutes, 12 to 12.30. And then we rest. And then we, we work out. We, we go to the, to the gym around 2 p.m. till like 3.30. 2 p.m. Wow. to 3.30. And then uh, uh, after the gym, we go to hot and cold uh, uh, jacuzzis for recovery. So you go five minutes in the hot jacuzzi. And then five minutes on the cold. So you do it three sets. Five minutes on the hat again. Five minutes on the cold for for recovery. And then we go home, you know, spend time with family, watch some film, and then try to uh, sleep early, like 10, 11. And then wake up again. Uh, do it all uh, over. Yeah, do it all over again, uh, like five times a week. Because usually there's games on the weekend, like on a Saturday or on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So kind of like, kind of like full day, kind of like full day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Like, so it's basically like a, I mean, that's, that's pretty much your whole lifestyle. Like you're, it's an everyday thing. Like it's, it's pretty, it is, a, it is a job. Um, that's crazy. So you guys will start at three, like at nine in the morning and then be done by like, would you say again? Like, was it like, four? Like, like three thirty. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but you need to be you need to be doing your uh, warm up shooting at like six thirty seven, and then do your warm ups. You know your band work. So uh, sometimes you know if if there's there are light days, after the two p.m. to three thirty uh, weight room, the gym, we we go swim a little bit, like thirty minutes for you know for more cardio, mm -hmm. some some recovery. So yeah, so yeah, it's a uh, it's a busy, uh, you know, busy day. Yeah. Chris, go ahead. If you had to go, if you had to play a, a, a pickup game of two on two and you got, you got to pick up any, any NBA legend from, <laughs> from like the beginning of the NBA to now, yeah. um, who, who, who is the one player you would have by your side? Uh, uh of course, uh, Michael Jordan. And then, <laughs> then hopefully, <laughs> hopefully Scotty Pippen will also be there, <laughs> and uh, LeBron James. <laughs> hey, that, hey, that's a good, that'd be a good, uh, good forearm for right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that would be my lineup. What was like, like uh, so obviously, like you have to go to like they have when you go up to a professional basketball team, they obviously have like tryouts and stuff like that, right? So what is a 
what does a professional basketball combine look like? Uh, well, uh, if you start with the draft, uh, kind of like the NBA, you know, uh, most players come from college. Some players uh, already played professional leagues in, in other countries. Some players uh, played the uh, amateur uh Amateur leagues like here, we have CBA, we have uh, the G League, you know, kind of semi-professional. And then uh, we apply for the draft. You know, uh, most of most of us, we have agents. Yeah. Like the NBA, we have agents. Then the agents talk to the owners. Hey, I'm going to apply my player for the draft. And then uh, the draft day, I would say only two to three days. Mostly two days. You know, first day, you have your... Your workouts where they, they, they count how, how many push-ups you can do, how many pull-ups you can do, how, how fast is your sprint, you know, sprint, lateral movement, defensive slides, back pedal, lateral movement, defensive slides. So they, they, uh, they, they record it. They also check your vertical jump, you know, how high, kind of like the NBA, uh, what, what they do. And then second day, skill work, a lot of skill work, you know, guard skills, big man skills. And then on the third day, uh, games, you know, and then there will be champions, there will be MVPs. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then uh, after maybe 15 to 20 days, draft day comes. So hopefully you get picked. And then uh, when you get picked, uh, they will tell you when it's the first day of practice, but when you get drafted, you're you're not sure that you, you you're gonna sign. It's mm -hmm. it's not yet sure, you know. It, it doesn't mean that you get drafted. You're gonna play uh, right. in a professional team, so you still need to show up. Uh, so after one week of practice, they're gonna tell you if they're if you're gonna sign or not. Now, if you're gonna sign, they're gonna tell you how many years. Sometimes only one year, two years, three years. Sometimes uh, one month only. One conference is about three to four months. So they will tell you one conference only three to four months. Now, if you don't get drafted, you still have a chance because you can always ask for help from some coaches. Hey, coach or agents, can I, can I try out with that team? And like, uh, like Ben Wallace, you know. Ben Wallace, he was undrafted. Now he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah. Uh, he, he won the championship. <laughs> he's one of the few who were able to to contain Shaq, you know, there are some, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of stories in the Philippines where they weren't drafted, but they were able to flourish, flourish in the professional league. That's awesome. That's, that's, that's great. Um, I guess like for, cause I hear it all the time, like as a coach myself, like, and I'm sure you hear it too. Like you hear, you hear players all the time. Like you ask them like, what is it that you want to do? Like when you grow up and, and, you hear athletes say like I want to be like in the NBA or I want to be in the NFL or I want to play like a, some kind of professional sport. Mm -hmm. What what advice would you give a player um, that you know like a young a young athlete? What advice would you give uh, a young athlete? Maybe like in, let's say like they come from maybe like not the best like home life or something. You know like what advice would you give an athlete to achieve that goal to become a professional athlete? Uh, that was that's an awesome question, Coach. Uh, well, the best advice I can give is you need always you always need to ask the Lord, because the Lord will impress to your heart uh, the passion of whatever sport it is. It could be basketball or football. Of course, you'll feel it. You'll feel it. So, whenever you play, it's like oh, I love playing football. I love playing basketball. So you'll feel that passion. Now, when you whenever you feel it, whenever you enjoy, you need to ask the Lord. Lord, is this really the route I need to take? Please, you know, please let me know. Please give me wisdom. Please show me the direction. Please uh, help me with my decision making. Now, if you feel peace, if you felt the peace, you know, if you, if you felt like, oh, yeah, the Lord is really kind of telling me this is what I need to do. Now you go. You go all out. You know, you, you set your mind to it. You put, you put the, the goal and then you, you aim high. You can't be just like... Oh, I want to play in high school and I'll be fine. I'll be happy. No, sky's the limit. You know, we have a big God, so nothing is impossible. So just uh, just try your best, you know, to reach the highest level of basketball. In, in the Philippines, uh, my, my former coach, uh, Coach Bang uh, Tumapat, uh, he told me, uh, when you dream, you dream the highest. Let's say you dream 
uh, like you're gonna play in the NBA. Because if you dream like very low and then you didn't make it, you're gonna you're gonna get a, a low a low uh, result. But if you dream like really high, let's say NBA or or, or, or you're part of the Olympic team. If you don't make it, you're still gonna be a professional player because you you aim like really high. You like you uh, you put yourself in a high position. And plus, you know, you you, you need to do your work. You know, uh, the Bible says uh, faith without work is dead. So you need to really uh, put put work onto it. That's a great advice, coach. Appreciate that, Chris. Go ahead. Uh, what were some different uh different ways that you helped your teammates improve oh uh, i love that question uh well different ways uh and how how i can help my uh my teammates improve i i always uh uh you know uh, partner with them with shooting let's say uh yeah shoot with me let's say coach thomas uh shoot me with me and let's try this uh skill work and then Mostly, I show a video. Let's say Luca Donches. Look how Luca uses the pick and roll. Okay, let's let's try it and uh, you know let's try it in uh, in training. Let's try to uh, to do it. Uh, and then uh, I also give some advice, like mostly unsolicited advice, but you know in a nice way. Let's say you know uh, it's better if you if you go all out. You should not be scared. You know any any anyway. The other team won't kill us, so the only thing we, we uh, b- bad thing that that's gonna happen is that we're gonna lose the game. But but we need to really go all out. Uh, so yeah, mostly like partner shooting, partner skills. We I do a lot of one on one before, like like me me and Coach Thomas, one of our players, Jocelyn. We 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 do one on one sometimes. Yeah, because iron sharpens iron. You can only bring out the best uh, with well, each other. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you really go all out, you know, with one-on-one drills, you'll be able to apply apply those uh, skills you've been working on. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, so I guess, like, life after, like, what is life after basketball been like for you? Well, uh, life after basketball for me is is mostly mentorship, like me and uh, Coach Thomas are doing with the uh, Tulare Union Varsity girls. We're trying our best. It's always, you know, it's always, uh, it's always. Uh, you can always, you can always do as much. You can always do as much. You can only do as much. So we're trying our best. We're focusing on uh, on what we can share, and then the results. We we just uh, let the Lord handle it because we can only do as much. So. We we were trying to share what what uh, what we've been experiencing throughout the years, you know, uh, advices from other coaches. Like for example, uh, uh, let's say a player doesn't get enough playing time or a player gets cut. So what I usually tell the players: don't don't let anyone tell you that uh, you're not good enough, or don't let anyone. Tell you that you're gonna you're not gonna be successful. It, it doesn't mean that you got cut here or you don't have playing time. It means the end of the world. No, you can still go to another team where you know you'll have more value. They're gonna use you more. It's not the end of the world. So keep keep pounding. You know, keep pounding. You have the Lord. So more of mentorship, based on experience. We just want to share. We don't we don't keep it in ourselves with ourselves. We just try to. Uh, to guide to guide the uh, the players the best way we can. That's good. I like that. But uh, I guess like for my next my next question that I have is like obviously like you're a you're a coach now like coaching the at Tulare Union High School uh, girls basketball. Um, what is what's uh, been your favorite part so far of uh, of coaching at the high school level? Well. Uh... The best part is whenever they apply the the skills you you taught them. You know, the best part for me is whenever uh, they've been trying to figure out how how they can shoot the basketball. They've been trying to figure out how to break defense, how to guard other people. And so you, you you try to show it to them, and then it worked. You know, and then you will see their faces. You know, like yes, I did it. It worked. So you know, it's it's a lot of fulfillment. You know, praise God for those knowledge. So that's that's the best part. You know, for them being able to apply those uh, skills you've uh, taught them. That's awesome. Go ahead, Chris. If there was one uh, NBA coach that you could shadow, 
shadow for a season, who would it be? Uh, I would say Phil Jackson because uh, uh, he has a good choice. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. Phil, Phil Jackson is uh, very calm, you know, very composed. But, you know, sometimes uh, he shouts, he, he gets mad. And then he uh, he always you know explains why. They say he tells Dennis Rodman to uh, stop partying. You know he asks Michael Jordan to pick Dennis Rodman up. Uh, then you know uh, Phil you know doesn't really like suspend or scold uh, Dennis Rodman. Kind of like getting mad sometimes, but you know he explains why. Yeah, because there are some. Some players who you know who don't really play well when they get scolded. So there should be balance. There should be balance. But mostly you need to be composed and you need to explain, explain to the players uh, why you got mad, why they they need to do this stuff. You know. Yeah. So I would say Phil Jackson. That's a real, that's a that's so, a yeah, darn good choice. <laughs> that is a good. That is a real good choice right there. Uh, like being a. Being being a professional basketball player, like what was your, what would you say, like one of your biggest strengths as a basketball player? Was? Uh, biggest strength, I would say composure. Uh, I would say I have emotional stability. Let's say the one player elbowed me in the face. You know, I don't, I don't retaliate right away. Actually, I don't retaliate like elbow them in the face also. No, not like that. But, you know, I, I don't, I don't uh, make a move right away because the referees are watching us. And then maybe after one or two uh, runs, I bump them a little bit, you know, trying to be physical, trying to let them know that, uh, well, kind of like letting them feel that you, you can't just bully me or, or you should not be doing that. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you don't, if you don't uh, be physical with them, they're just going to hunt you. They're just going to do it all over and over again. So kind of like uh, trying to let them know that that's not okay. Uh, compared to a lot of players, when they get hit, they get they, they hit back right away or they punch <laughs> back, right? So uh, I would say, yeah, that's my greatest uh, uh, asset, the emotional stability, the, the composure. That's good, yeah. The, I guess like, so playing like, I mean, because you obviously play at like a real high level, like how important is it like, Let's say like one night, because I'm not everyone can play perfect every single night. Um, athletes, ath I mean, even some of the greatest like Steph Curry and all these guys, like they have bad nights shooting. They have nights where they can't score, um, or just you know like maybe you're going 0 for 10 from the three point line, and like no, it just seems like everything that could go wrong is going wrong that night. How do you like mentally get past that? Because like it can get frustrating, especially like for like someone like maybe like a high school level type player because you see it a lot in, in the high school level like they get frustrated because the shot's not falling like how are you able to get past nights like that where you're just not having the best night playing ball yeah that's a that's an awesome question and uh it's a it's a good tip to kids also uh well first of all you you ask help from the lord because uh, i always believe that uh if you give God your weakness, He will give you His strength. So ask help from the Lord. Lord, I'm struggling. I need to make baskets. This is my last year in high school. I need to impress a lot of uh, college scouts. This is very important to me. So you need you, you need to uh, ask help from the Lord because the Lord is our partner. And then, uh, yeah, you need to rest. You need to rest uh, very well. You need to sleep. And then the next day, you work on your free throws or... You work on that spot. Let's say you've been struggling on the right wing. So keep shooting on the right wing with uh, game moves, you know, game, game situation. Like, let's say you, you cut to the middle first and then you flash to the wing and then shoot, you know. Uh, keep on uh, practicing, in, uh, practicing it, but you need to uh, pay attention to your form. You might be shooting, uh, your, your form might not be good, you know. Maybe uh, ask a favor from a friend to to rebound for you. You know, get the ball from you and and uh, practice again. Oh, what did I do wrong? Uh, okay. You can also uh, you can also ask your coaches, your your other mentors, people you look up to. Hey, what's what's happening with my shot? Uh, do I look worried in the game? Do I look sluggish? So ask opinions from people who really care for you. 
And uh, keep on practicing again. Consistent form uh, produces consistent results. That's it. That's, that's good. Uh, definitely good advice. Because like I said, like you see athletes sometimes are just, you know, like they're frustrated during the game because they can't make a shot. or And then to try and have to like regain, like re try and regain confidence, like sometimes that could be tough, you know? So I, I like the advice that you gave for that. Um, like playing, like how... Was it hard for you, like, to ever, like, keep focus? Uh, like, obviously, you were, your goal was trying to make it to, like, the pro league and everything. Was there times where it was hard, like, to, uh, I guess, like, I'm trying to think of the word, like, because, uh, like, obviously, like, there's distractions outside of basketball. So, like, for example, like, uh, players, like, you know, getting invited to, like, parties and stuff, like, having to shut down, things like that, you know, to, because you're trying to chase a dream of, like how how hard was it for you to like uh kind of like shut out those distractions uh yeah very good question coach uh, my uh my former coach uh coach bang tumapat uh he uh, he always uh tells me that you only you're only young once meaning your uh your age from i would say 14 years old Old until 25 years old that's your stretch that's your youth youth age where you can really develop a lot of habits you can really develop your game after that you can't you can't bring it back anymore so those ages those those uh, span of years you should really give your all you should really give your your hundred percent training habit forming everything because those are the crucial stages 14 to 25 or 14 13 to 23 years old so you really need to you know to go all out you know no, no vices no night outs uh really like pound every day in the gym and then just tell yourself that after that you know you can you can party a little bit go to birthday parties uh but before that you can't you can't uh you can't mess around so knowing your priorities you know if you really want to be a top athlete best best in your position best in your league uh you really need to pound pound those years because you're only young you're only young once yeah and then imagine imagine your adulthood from i would say 26 to 80 years old that's long so you just need to focus on this stage like this stage 14 to 25 give me your all give me your all. give me all your focus and attention and everything then after that you can you know focus a little bit on on uh, family parties, you know, spending time with family, sleeping late a little bit, especially when you have uh, when you have children. But before <laughs> that, those are the crucial years. We need to know your priorities. Yeah, mm -hmm. appreciate that advice, Coach. Go ahead, Chris. Any uh, any pregame rituals, like something that you had to do before each game to set the tone? Yeah, so pre-game rituals, I do a lot of core work, like the planks, front planks, side planks, uh, some back extensions. And then I do a lot of balancing, like I balance with one leg and then I close my eyes. And then I wrap the ball around my uh, my uh, my waist. So uh, uh, a lot of core work, you know, balancing, but not a lot of weights because, uh, you know, you don't want to be really tired. Uh, before the game but the core work you know the core work will uh, will solve all your muscle imbalance because you know our, our body are normally uh, not balanced your front muscles are always stronger than your back muscles that's why you run faster than when you're doing your back pedals the back muscles are usually weaker so you kind of want to you know um, uh, improve on that you know to balance your muscles but if your core is right you know if, if your core is activated it kind of helps you balance all parts of your body and then you want uh, you want to eat right of course uh, no no soda no no chips you know no cereals no processed food just just all natural food uh, a lot of carbs you know a lot of carbs and water uh, one day before uh, morning you need to uh, pack up you know, carb loading and fluids, uh, and then a lot of foods too. And then do your inhale, exhale, kind of like yoga, yoga in the morning. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, like, what was your, so like the first time that you were ever picked up by a professional basketball team, mm -hmm. what was that feeling like? What was your, 
emotions like knowing that you that you made it uh, i was super happy you know uh i uh i thank the lord and then i really believe that uh he's faithful with his promises that if you do the work you know you dedicate everything to him he will give you the results you want uh but i remember i was kind of mad because uh, i was picked number 10 where i felt like i should be higher so you know the my my first year my rookie season is like vindication you know vindication is like i want to prove everyone that i'm the best rookie in our class you know that they made the mistake picking me number 10 so it was a it was a fire it, it gave me the fire inside gave me the drive uh to uh to show everyone that uh I should be higher. I should get better uh, contract, you know. So that first year was was memorable. Uh, uh, I think uh, I played okay, though I didn't get the rookie of the year. But I think I, I played okay. What? Mm -hmm. So like throughout your career, like what kind of awards have you have you won? Whether it be like throughout high school or um, or beyond, like into the pros leagues. Like what what kind of awards, if you don't mind sharing, that you that you actually let you won uh i would say uh championships during my elementary years championships in high school two mvps in high school uh one mvp in college one six man of the year award in college uh scoring champion in college and then college basketball kind of like an all-american top five like all all uh, all NBA first team kind of like that in college, and then uh, during the pros, uh, all rookie first team, uh, and then I supposed to get a All Star MVP award, but we lost the game, uh, and then of course then the national team stint. Although in the national team there's no uh, MVPs, uh, but we were able to win one championship, uh, and then. One one uh, one slam dunk champion <laughs> in two thousand in two thousand and four, which it was a fluke, but you know, praise <laughs> God and then two, uh, <laughs> and then it was a fluke, <laughs> yeah, fluke, and then championships with the three on three national team, uh, and then uh, two uh, three point uh, champion, three point shootout championships, yeah. Awesome. Awesome, Coach. Congratulations you, Coach. for your achievements. Thank uh, Chris, you. Thank you. So, yeah, playing in different countries, uh, what was your favorite place to play and visit? Uh, favorite place to play and visit? Uh, honestly, I enjoyed playing in Russia. You know, the weather is good. Uh, the, you know, the, the country, a lot of very nice... Uh, you know, sites, uh, amusements, parks, uh, buildings. Uh, uh, people were, you know, crazy in basketball. They were really supporting. Uh, a lot of very good players and tall, tall players because Russians are taller than Americans. So a lot of very tall players. I, I would also include uh, Serbia. A lot of very good players in Serbia. Like the players there have very high basketball IQ. Like super, excuse me, like super high. So it's very nice. Like you're playing chess, chess while like while playing basketball, <laughs> and they're strong. They're strong. Uh, I would, I would uh, also include in Australia. Uh, for me, the Australians are one of the strongest people in the world. It's like you thought they 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 tried to to hurt you or bump you hard, but no, it's just normal. They're just kind of like moving because they're they're naturally strong. And uh, of course, the United States, you know, we have the best basketball players in the world here. <laughs> that's, awesome. that's cool. So you got to, you've actually got to travel like literally, I mean, just about almost everywhere at school. Um, yeah, congratulations. Uh, Chris, do you have any more questions? Uh, no, I think that's it. That's it. All right. Yeah. So my, uh, I guess my, my final question uh, before we close it out. Uh, well, actually, I guess I have two more questions. So like you're you're a coach right now obviously at Tulare Union High School um do you have any plans like moving up in in the coaching field do you want to coach college I know you're you could probably coach in the NBA if you wanted to or even like in maybe like the 
uh, in like overseas leagues if you wanted to. Like, where where do you kind of see yourself going? Um, how far do you want to? See, how far do you would like to take a coaching career? Well, uh, my dream, my dream is to coach in the NBA, uh, whether head coach or skills coach or assistant coach or whatever coach you know, depending on the God's will for me. That's that's my that's my dream. That's my goal. But you know, if the Lord only wants me to stay in Tulare, it's fine with me. You know, if uh, the Lord wants me to, you know, guide the kids, you know, uh, uh, players who want to, you know, aspire to to play overseas, play in the NBA. That's 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 fine with me. You know, whatever the Lord wants for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I, I guess my final question, my final question to close it all out is. Um, for like any like advice to any athletes out there, like what would you, what advice would you give anybody if you can give any advice to anyone? Yeah, so what I always tell our uh, Tolari Union girls, uh, focus on improving one percent every day. Set your goals, you know, set your goals high. NBA, uh, play in the Olympic team, but focus on uh, every step, you know. Focus on those little victories, because the problem is when you focus too much on the on the goal, you wanna dribble like Kyrie right away. <laughs> it's ninety percent impossible, you know. Uh, so you're just gonna get frustrated because you're you're aiming too much on perfection. So progress, not perfection. Like I always tell the girls, uh, Coach Thomas, focus on every possession in the game, focus on every quarter, you know, focus on every move. Try to perfect the move, and then you know the the Lord will just uh, take care of the rest. Do your best, and God will do the rest. That is one of my favorite things, like <laughs> that I've heard. Where literally anyone ever say was like, from a from like a coaching standpoint, like get one percent better every day. Like I I've, I've never would have thought to even say anything like that. Like and it's true. Like just focus on one thing uh-huh. every day and just get better. You know, um, and you can only really get one percent better every single day just and just keep improving every day so um like hearing that like that's just that's awesome coach so i appreciate you um yeah i mean do you have do you have any final thing that you want to say before we end before we end here with you coach yeah so uh i appreciate you so much coach thomas or chris and our friend here everyone everyone and everyone in the team thank thank you for having me and uh Hopefully, Coach Thomas, we win tomorrow. <laughs> that's, that's my prayer, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so thank you so much, you know. Uh, always always give your best, you know. Nothing is impossible. I'll give your best. But my, my best advice is always ask the Lord. Because uh, maybe, maybe the Lord doesn't want you to play in the NBA, but He wants you to be a manager of an NBA team or a baseball team or you need to ask him. He knows everything, you know, because we don't want to be pursuing on the on the wrong thing, you know, and then we get frustrated, we get depressed. So we don't want that. But, you know, we can always ask the Lord. It's free. You know, we don't need to. We don't need Internet. We don't need uh, to, uh, to, to call a friend. No, we can we can ask him directly and then he will he will surely guide us. Yeah. Thank you, Coach Thomas. Some of the best advice, Coach. And I appreciate you coming on here and taking the time with us. I know you're you're a very busy guy. I know you have your own uh your you have your your jobs that you work and then you have your uh you, you do like the basketball camp too, correct? Yeah, yeah, the Dylan Ababu basketball uh, academy, skills and player development. Yeah, on this Instagram uh, account. And thank you. Thank you, Coach Thomas, so much. Thank you. Appreciate you coming on here, Coach. Like I said, I know you're extremely, extremely busy. I I talk to you about practice, and you're just like, yeah, I work this, I do that, I do this. I do. I'm like, coach, do you ever sleep? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I slept before uh, our episode, like, 45 minutes. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> I yeah, appreciate you <laughs> time on here, coach, with us. Uh, and hopefully, maybe one day we can even have you back on here again. We, we enjoy having you on here. So, um, yeah, appreciate it, coach. Uh, Chris, do you have anything else? I uh, know it's always a pleasure, coach. Good to see yeah. you again. This Good to see you. Just invite me if you need me, guys. We will. Well, I'm sure we'll have you. Uh, we'll probably, we might even have you for our uh, 
I mean, we, our our podcast kind of come a long way. So uh, when we hit the maybe the one hundredth episode, it'll be it'll be special. So we might even <laughs> we might even invite you back. So yeah, we'd love to have you back. So appreciate thank you. It. Anytime, coach. More power and be praying for the success of this podcast. Awesome. Thank you. Thank yes, you, coach. Have thank a good you. day. Bye. 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 Thank you. So that was a uh, former uh, professional basketball player right there, Dylan Ababu. We appreciate him coming on here. Um, it was an honor getting to talk to him, uh, especially from someone uh, who's played like at a at a high level like that. It's 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 hard for like you know like I mean players like their goal is to play at the NBA and, and stuff or or play overseas and like <laughs> out of all the people in the world, like literally only maybe like one or two percent will even make it, you know, and he got to live that dream. So that's, that's awesome. awesome. And I'm happy for him and any, anything's, anything is possible. So, um, yeah, we appreciate him coming on here. So with that, I'm going to let you Karsha take us, take us <laughs> off the rest of the way. Um, Caitlin Clark continues her remarkable season as she continues to chase the record of most points scored in a season which is 3,527, set back in 2017, by Kelsey Plum from Washington. Clark currently sides at number seven at 3,114 3, total points in a career and he's averaging 30.5 points per game, which is ranked number one in the nation. Guys, we all know Caitlin Clark is great, but how special is she? And do you guys think she will break this record? Only 413 points shy and 18 games left to go. Go for it, Chris. Oh, you want me to go first on this one? Yeah, you can take it. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's, special, she's a special player. Um, I, Me personally, I think she's going to get it. Like, she's, I mean, like I said, averaging, averaging 30, 30 points a game, like, that's – that's high, you know, like that, yeah. that's for, for, I mean, think about it. Like we just got done saying how hard the, the game of the, the game of basketball is like, especially like once you start hitting that college level, like you're, once you hit that college level, like, I mean, you're pretty close to like making it to the pros, you know, like, yeah. and you're literally competing like against the best in the world, you know? Um, and Caitlin Clark, that's, I mean, 30 points a game says it all, you know, like how great she is. Uh, right. I, I said this when we talked about Caitlin Clark uh, earlier, like in our podcast and when we first began this thing. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm comparing her like to like that Steph Curry type player. Like she's <laughs> literally changing the game, how this game is playing. When she shoots threes, like, I mean, she's shooting threes that like no other player takes, you know, like, yeah. and that's what Steph Curry does. Like Steph Curry takes shots that like no other, like, for any player to take a shot like that, you're you they're like yeah, no, get on the bench. Like but for Steph Curry, it's like it's okay. But you know, go ahead, pull it from half court if you want. Like and that's how it is with Caitlin Clark. Like any player that shoots from five feet behind the three point line, you're like, get on the bench. But with her, it's like, take it. It's a good shot. Like yeah. it's crazy. But she's changed the way the game's being played. That's why I'm saying like when she when she gets to the WNBA, I I do think like she's going to end up being one of, when it's all said and done, probably one of the best players that's ever played the game. Um, I mean, you don't just dominate in college like this and then go to the NBA and then just completely fall apart, you know, like, yeah. especially like in the WNBA, you know, maybe, maybe like it's different when it's in men's basketball, you know, but like for like the WNBA, like it's, I mean, it, the, the WNBA is still kind of trying to kind of grow a little bit, you know? Um, and I think, I personally think that she's going to be one of those players that like really changes everything about the WNBA. I think she's going to um, like, I know like a lot of the girl, like, a lot of the women and, and the professional basketball league, like their whole thing is like, they want to get paid more and stuff. And I think Caitlin Clark's going to bring that, bring that change to the, to the WNBA. I know a lot of people kind of don't like her because of her, you know, she's kind of, she plays with like, a little bit of cockiness, but she's not like verbally, she's not like super cocky, you know, like she just has that cockiness a little bit to her of her style of play. But I mean, rightfully so like Steph Curry has it too, but yet a lot of people love Steph Curry, you know, like when he's, <laughs> when he's on fire and he's hitting four, four threes in a row and he's shimmying, shimmying down the court, like rightfully so. I mean, like when you know, you're one of the, 
the greatest shooter that God has ever created. Like, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you want to play with a little bit of cockiness like that? You know, um, and I think Caitlin Clark's probably one of the best female shooters that I that is, and, and it's actually going to end up being one of, when it's all said and done. She will be one of the greatest female shooters that's ever played the game, or how we say for Steph, like if not one of the best female basketball players and shooters that God's ever created. I think that's how it's going to be for Caitlin Clark. Like, and I mean, she's only 413 points away with 18 games to go, regular season games to go, plus the NCAA tournament. Like, yeah. I mean, come on. Like, how can you not say, <laughs> like, especially averaging, I, even if she was averaging 25 points a game, she would still hit that mark. Yeah. 30 points a game, like, she's going to hit that easy. Um, and like I said, like, Think about it. How many athletes are in college basketball? There's a lot, right? There's a lot of athletes, and she's number one in scoring. Like that. I mean, it's it's hard to even be in like top twenty, let alone number one. Like that's yeah, that, exactly. that's something. Like how special she is, and and she's getting better. Like I feel like since we began the season, like she's just improved. Like we're only thirteen games in into the regular into the regular season, and she's improved so much since game one of the regular season and like just throughout her college career every year she's gotten better you know um so yeah it's she's a special player for sure uh definitely yeah yeah, she's exciting to watch yeah i agree like with 18 games left she's definitely gonna (laughs) definitely gonna break that record um definitely something that the uh, wm nba is going to it's going to really help help them out um when you get a player like this um, it's going to re- revolutionize uh, something for the WNBA, just like like you mentioned, like Steph Curry did for the NBA and Michael Jordan, and so on. Um, yeah, man, she she looks like Steph Curry. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, not not identical, but I mean, like for 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 uh, from a Everybody, woman's standpoint, yeah. like yeah, like just a really fun player to watch. And I think it's going to attract more viewers as well for the WNBA when they see something like that. Mm. Uh, It just makes the game exciting. You know, Um, every once in a while you need some change and you need something big like that. Um, But no, yeah, I agree. Just she's, she's definitely going to be, you can, you can tell she'll, she'll be a legend eventually in the NBA Uh, breaking records. Just so many, so many great things to see. So very exciting. Yeah, I I, I enjoy watching her, um, especially like, I mean, just I she's brought in that Iowa program to like, yeah. I mean, she's brought in that program up by herself. You know, like I I know they've had other players kind of help her out and stuff. You know, I'm not saying you know it's just a one a one one person show, but she's pretty much like ninety percent of the reason of why that program is relevant because before Caitlin Clark, like who was Iowa? Like I didn't even I didn't even really know that Iowa had a girls basketball team, you know. Like I know I know them from from the boys basketball, but like she's a big reason why and when when they when she started kind of the first emergence, she was making a lot of this noise and and they were saying like she's they were comparing her like a Steph Curry and I was like, she's good, but she I don't think she'll emerge like a Steph Curry type player. Like that's that's like I mean you're you're talking a whole different ballpark you know yeah um but when you see the way she's improved in literally like less than a year it's it's remarkable it's like how can you not really compare her to a player like that you know exactly um but she's brought in that program up literally by herself and um i mean just when you look at the t- team last year that she had like like it was good but they don't make it to the ncaa championship without her like that yeah. team would that team would have that team would have maybe maybe snuck in to the to the NCAA tournament. Like she was a big reason. Like nobody could guard her. Nobody could stop her. Um and you're seeing it like it's nearly impossible to stop her this year. Like, you know, like mm-hmm. it's like I said, she's gotten so much better. Um like the improvements from, from last year is remarkable. Like she's literally made like this big of a jump, like yeah. uh, on how big on how good she's improved. And when you see the improvements in her from this year and last year, you're like, how could, how could you not have Iowa favorite to win the national championship? Like, I mean, they they have to be the favorites. I know you still have LSU and 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 those teams, but like, this is a different Iowa basketball team than we saw last year, you know. Um, but yeah, 
I mean, you have to have uh, me personally, like I have them in the national championship. I, I think you're going to have to stop, stop her. You're going to have to stop her. And, and there's really no one really that, that can stop her. Like she's just an unguardable player. And it's, yeah. we always like, it's like a video game watching Steph Curry play. Like when you watch Caitlin Clark play, it's like, the, it's like watching a video game. Like it's just unfair. You know, you can't, she can drive to the basket. She can pull up from five feet behind the three-point line. Uh, she's not afraid of the contract. She'll drive her the contract, get the and one. Like, right. and she's a good. She sees the court. She sees the court so good. Like she has that like Steph Curry type vision. You know, like Chris yeah. Paul type vision on the court. She'll find her teammates and get the ball there. Um, like she just has. She has everything about everything. Um, a high basketball IQ, obviously. Um, She's just great. I mean, to think when you're already talking about a player in college and already kind of having that discussion of like that she could be one of the greatest players of all time, like that's how you know she's great already, you know? Yeah. Obviously, she's prove it in the WNBA, but I think she'll be just fine. Um, and I think, she, I mean, obviously, she has no problem shooting five feet behind the three point line, and that the NBA three point line is a little bit further back. So, um, Obviously, she has no problem shooting it, you know. So uh, she'll be just fine in that category. So um, and she'll probably be pulling up from five feet behind on that one too. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait to watch her break this record. I think she'll get it. Uh, I think she'll get it before 18 games. I, I'm 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 gonna say within 12 to 15 games. I think she'll get it. Um, but yeah, she's she's great. Um, if not one of the best one of the best college basketball players really ever. Yeah, I agree. The comeback story of Joe Flanco continues as he defeated his former team in the New York scored New York Jets by a score of 37-20. Joe Flacco passed for 30, 309 yards and three touchdowns. With the Browns winning, they now improved to 11-5 and on the year and currently sit in second place in the AFC North and have now officially clinched the playoff sport. Guys, what has been the key to this turnaround, and are the Browns real threats in the playoffs? <laughs> well, the, the key turnaround is, is Joe Flacco. <laughs> surprisingly, uh, huh? Yeah, surprisingly. Um, I mean, shoot, even with the like their quarterback situation before that, whether it was Deshaun Watson, uh, or any, anybody else playing, they they're just like, they're they're a really good team. Um, I mean, they beat the Forty ers and and like honestly, they can go. I think they can give uh, Baltimore a run for their money. Like like if you put them in a, in a in a playoff game against each other, just a one game one game matchup. Like I wouldn't be surprised if they could actually pull off a win against a team like Baltimore. I'm not saying they're gonna do it, but. I, I also wouldn't be surprised. Um, but no, yeah, Joe Flacco, um, I didn't even know the guy played anymore, <laughs> to be honest with you. The moment I heard his name, I'm like, ah, I, I don't see anything big happening with him. And then all of a sudden he starts racking up these wins, and they, they look good. Honestly, the way, the way they've played, they've had one of the one of the best defenses in the league, like, all, all season. Like, they've right. been pretty consistent. Um, and, like – Leading up into the playoffs, they they are one of the hot teams, like one of those teams you might have to worry about. Then again, it's the Browns, though. When you <laughs> when you when you when you think about it, you're like, uh, you can't really imagine them making it all the way to the Super Bowl. But they could easily be be in the second round, and maybe like if the cards play right for them, they they might be in the AFC Championship. That's that's a far stretch, I know, but. Definitely, I could see them as in a in a second round situation, and depending on who they play, like I said, you you might see them, might see them in the AFC Championship. So I don't know. I think a, a guy like Joe Flacco can can do that for them. Yeah. That behind that 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 awesome defense and uh, <laughs> Amari Cooper, my God, Cowboys, slap yourself. <laughs> Why why'd you get rid of that man? Why? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's. If, if I, I can tell you right now, I would have probably Dallas Cowboys a heavy, heavy favorite to make it to the Super Bowl if they would have, if they would have kept 
Amari Cooper. Yeah. Like that that would have equaled what the Niners have on their offense for sure, hands down. Like mm-hmm. I mean, you're literally talking about I still think Amari Cooper is probably one of the top ten receivers in the league. Hands oh, by far. Easily. And for them to to let him go was it was just like, What are you guys doing? Like, you know, I feel like I don't know, that was that was real dumb. Um what he's done for the Raiders the Cowboys and the Browns like you don't go from just three different teams and they put on put on that same performance for three different teams that just shows you're a, a freaking you're definitely you know a top receiver yeah uh, when, when I when I think about the Browns you like I mean I literally look at them as I know like they're they're ranked they're, I want to say it's like number seven three four five yeah like number yeah they're ranked number seven and the def and in defense like they're a top 10 defense in the league right um but i mean dude like i would have them i mean i would have them ahead of the broncos you know like the broncos defense is good but i mean i would have them against ahead of the broncos possibly even cincinnati like they're definitely like i'm surprised they're a number seven ranked defense like i look at as like a top three defense like think about this the bears are a number two ranked defense in the league the bears the Bears. The Bears. The Bears no have way. <laughs> defense in the league. Like, that's crazy to think about rushing-wise. Uh, and then passing-wise, the Bears are still right number two. But I would still – I mean, I would have Cleveland, like, at least top three for sure. If not, at least – at the very least, top five. Um, they're for sure, like, hands down, one of the best defenses in the league. Um, and if they're – like, if their defense continues to play, like, think about that. They're, think about this, like, they put up 37 points tonight. Think about that. Like that's a lot of points. And if your defense continues to to get big stops like they have been, yeah. and your offense can put up like 20, let's just say 24 plus points a game, mm-hmm. like that, that's good enough to to sit there and say like, you know what? Like it's the Cleveland Browns, but that's good enough to to, to make a lot of noise. And that like you're talking about like. Possibly getting to that AFC title game, if not further. Like you know, yeah. like they're they're good enough. Um, and Joe Flacco has that like experience. You know, um, he has that experience of getting to a Super Bowl. He really does, and he obviously won one. Yeah. Um, so he has that experience, and I, and I think Joe Flacco's really kind of like revived his career. You know, I think the best situation for him to go to, and it's funny because like I joked about it when they picked him up. I was like. <laughs> they got Joe Flacco, like that's who their quarterback is. But we think of Joe Flacco from the Jets, the end, the you know the ending years in Baltimore. Um, we think about him going to the Jets when the Jets literally had like hardly anybody, you know. Yeah. Um, and then now you see him on on a on a pretty good Browns team, and you're like, he kind of likes the Browns. Kind of like saved his career, you know. Like you see a lot of uh, a lot of play, like you kind of saw like Iguodala. Like you look at Iguodala for example, like. Iguodala's kind of career started going down in Philadelphia. And then when he yeah. joined the Warriors, like, it kind of saved his career, you know? Uh, same thing with, like, players like JaVel McGee. Like, his career was, wasn't was that great. And then when he joined the Warriors, like, it it really re- saved his career, you know? It made him relevant again. Same thing with Joe Flacco. Like, when, it, when that disastrous end came to an end in, in Baltimore, you know, you thought, like, going to the Jets, you'd be like, oh, okay, like, maybe it's just a fresh start. But, it, yeah. It, it didn't end well, you know, like for him in New York. Um, and then to get his career revived and, and Cleveland, like Cleveland really kind of saved his career. Like this was like really his last go, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's balled out. He's, uh, he's done a good job uh, th- throwing for 300 plus yards a night um, with three touchdowns. Like it says a lot, you know? And yeah, um, I mean, how could you not, have Cleveland as a favorite like obviously they've already clinched a playoff spot they're, they're right, right and here's a crazy thing they can still take that number two seed like they could literally take a number two seed and if if Baltimore is not careful like you could be talking about the Cleveland Browns being a possible number one seed getting the first round by they're only one game behind yeah, that's, the Baltimore that's how, tight the, that's how tight the AFC is right yeah. now like it's it's, like, it's, it's, it's insane close. to think about dude like I mean, when you, when you look at Cleveland's remaining schedule, what is it, the, the Cincinnati Bengals? Let's say, like, the Bengals, they beat the Bengals, right? And mm-hmm. Baltimore Baltimore were to somehow lose. Because who's, 
I mean, let's see. Baltimore has to play who for the final week? Uh, um, I have no idea. Let me see. The Ravens have to play. The Ravens still have two games, so they got to play the Miami Dolphins and they got to play the Pittsburgh Steelers. Like those are two losable games. One reason why I say they're two losable games is because Miami's obviously a, a pretty decent team for one, you know, um, and they're still they're still fighting for playoff wise because they can literally drop from two all the way to like six or seven or even possibly miss the postseason. Yeah, that's a possibility. So they're fighting for their playoff lives. And then Pittsburgh Steelers are still kind of fighting for their playoff lives, but they're also like, like it's a rivalry game. It, mm-hmm. You know, like Steelers and Baltimore Ravens, like that's, that's, it has a lot of history to it. So when, when you think about it, like, what if Baltimore, like what if the Browns were to win? And like, let's say Baltimore loses, somehow loses out those two games or even loses one of those games. Like you're talking about a potential Cleveland Browns team that could steal <laughs> the number one seat and get a first round bye. Like, Think about that. Yeah, um, they played the Bengals for their final game, and that's that's a it's a winnable game. That's a winnable game. The way they've looked, like yeah. the way they've looked, they that's a very manageable, winnable game. Um, and like I said, they already <laughs> excuse me, they already clinched the the playoff berth. Um, they can't really fall anywhere lower than a five seed. So, you know, like they would have a home game. You know, yeah. or actually, no, they would have a home game. Um, I think they can maybe jump to what four no they can't even jump to four so they would have to actually travel because mm-hmm. uh jacksonville has a home game but um but i mean still like to think, think that they can even jump from five to two at the very least and if you jump from five to two like you're playing a number seven team like and that means you would be playing someone like either the colts the texans the colts or the texans like mm-hmm. you could you that's a very easy winnable game and then exactly. now you're going to travel to somewhere like uh, probably like Miami, you know? Um, and that would actually be a really interesting game to watch. So um, I think I think Cleveland Browns have a, have a shot, dude. I really do. The way they've looked, if their defense can stay healthy and continue playing the way they, they have, and Joe Flacco continues to light it up, and that offense keeps sparking points, like, watch out. I can tell you right now, the the Browns are basically the the Rams of of the end of the AFC. Like nobody wants to see the Rams in the playoffs, and yeah. because of how the Rams look, they're hot. Nobody wants to face the the, the there's a, if there's one team in the AFC, it's you don't want to face the Cleveland Browns. Like that's no, one team that not. you don't you don't want to face. Um, and that goes for all all of the six teams. That goes for Baltimore. That goes for. Miami, that goes for Kansas City, Jacksonville. Like, obviously, Jacksonville would have to face them in the first round. Uh, but, like, the Bills and obviously the either the Texans or the Colts, like, yeah, none of the teams want to see the Cleveland Browns in the, in the postseason. You just don't because right now they look good. Oh, yeah, all the way around. Their offense looks amazing. Their defense is just dominating. Yeah, that's, that's a dangerous team. Yeah, and, like, like – I mean, just, I mean, Joe Flacco, like I said, he's playing at a high level, dude. I mean, this year, 13 touchdowns to eight interceptions. Um, and his QBR rating of 90 has over 1,600 yards. I mean, he's he's playing good football. You know, he's taking yeah. care of the ball. Uh, I mean, you look at you look at his entire career, like, I mean, it, it's been pretty consistent, like, other than, like, the last, like, three years with the Jets. Like, I feel like, what do we always say with Jets quarterbacks? Like, you go, you go to the Jets to, to pretty much die, you know? Like, that's – and that's where Joe Flacco, I felt, died. Because you look at his final year in Baltimore, like, it wasn't the best year, but he also wasn't really healthy too much either, you know? Um, well, even, even when the, when Brett Favre first left uh, Green Bay, he went to the Jets. Like, nobody really really, really remembers that because it was just, like you said, like, they go, they go there to die. Then he goes on to go to um, to Minnesota, and all of a sudden he has kind of like a little brief. Um, he's kind of like brought back to brought back to life a little bit there, and they're like one game away from the Super Bowl. So that's kind of like what Joe Flacco over here is experiencing, and we we like you said we might actually see this man in the Super Bowl. It's Could crazy, happen. huh? Like because like I said, like he has that like he has that experience, you know, he has that yeah. experience of of being in the Super Bowl and. When you have that, when when you have that kind of experience, and you're playing with a team that like is kind of feeding off like 
the way he's playing. Like, I mean, everybody's literally – if you're on the Cleveland Browns, you're confident. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, think about it. When, when Deshaun Watson was out, like, all hope was out of Cleveland. There was no hope, you know. Exactly. And Joe Flacco was kind of – he's played, he's played really, really well. I, I have to give him credit. Um, and that's – he's kind of given that city hope, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And if, if I'm being honest, like, if, if he makes you a deep playoff run – how do you not? How do you not roll with him in the next year? Like, you might have to consider like, hey, you have Deshaun Watson. You know, Joe Flacco can probably play another two, at least another good two or three more years. Like, how yeah. about you, you? You might have to move on from Deshaun Watson, and you can do it before his rookie contract's up. You know, move him up, move him out, and and ship him away, and get get some more help into Cleveland to help the Cleveland Browns get you know get the missing pieces that they that they need. You know, so. Mm-hmm. If, if you're the Browns organization and, and he continues to, to play the way he's been playing, like, I mean, how could – why would you not want to roll with him, you know? Like, exactly. and if I'm him, I feel comfortable in that city. Like, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, you know? Like, this team took a chance on me and they gave me an opportunity. Because when Deshaun Watson went out, they, I mean, they literally could have picked anybody else. Like, they could have, they could have either done two things, say that the season's over and they could have tanked, or they could have went after other – other quarterbacks you know like those other quarterbacks yeah. that are out there maybe they could have went after Colin Kaepernick like just different there's quarterbacks out there that they could have went after and yet Joe Flacco was the one they decided to roll with yeah and it was a good decision and and he got a, a, a third opportunity and he's made the most of it he's looked really really well yeah no it's, it's wild just to think that he just came in took over and just like just been rolling hot right now yeah, I don't, I don't blame you. I, w- I wouldn't want to leave Cleveland either because like, the possibility of you might, you might have to go to, like, the commanders or the Bears. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You, yeah. you, you, know you're de- you know you're done at that point. Yeah. Um, in tonight's game between Golden State Warriors versus the Miami Heat in San Francisco, Miami defeated the Warriors by a score of 114 to 102. So, what do you guys think of this game, and what team do you guys support or favor more? Well, the Warriors of, I don't know, like the Warriors just they show me a lot of inconsistency. You know, <laughs> they haven't looked, they haven't looked good. Um, I mean, I, I, this, and it's concerning because, like, you have, like, you have a big home stretch here. This is an opportunity to get back on track. Mm-hmm. And they're still, they're still playing the same way they've been playing all year long, you know? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm really, really concerned with Golden State. Clay Thompson, of course, you know, kind of not as hot as he was. But, and I, and I knew uh, when Warrior fans were like, oh, Clay Thompson's back, like, He's not back. Give it time. You know, like, I want to see him play like this for a 15-game stretch or, you know, even if he has one bad game, like, you know, get back on track the next, like, and he's not. Like, he's literally had, like, I think the, like, the last, what, two games have been, like, his old self again, you know. Um, he hasn't looked He hasn't looked well. Uh, Steph Curry didn't play great tonight either. Um, and, and those are nights that you need guys like Clay Thompson to step up. Clay. Excuse me, Steph Curry can't play. Steph Curry can't get you thirty every night, you know. Like this is it. This is college basketball. This is the NBA where you're playing against the best in the world. He can't. He's not going to give you with eighty-two games. He's not going to give you thirty points a night. There's going to be nights where he's human. He's human. He's going to miss. He's going to miss shots. He might not make a three, or he might be like one for six. Like it's going to happen, you know. And yeah. those are the nights that you're going to need someone like Clay Thompson to step up and Andrew Wiggins, like, and they're not doing it, you know, like those guys are not doing it. I'm at the point where you need to start looking at, at the rest of like the season's not over. Mm-hmm. You, know, you need to start, you need to start like thinking like ahead. Like I feel like waiting until the all-star break to make a move is too late. I feel like they need to do it now. Yeah. Um, I feel like, I feel like you need to move Wiggins. Like this is the point to move him out. Like he, he had, he's had two good games all year. Three, 
he's had three good games this whole year out of what did they play like almost 31 games already 30 31 games 32 games and they've only had he's only had like three nights where you're like there it is there's Andrew Wiggins from the NBA finals yeah you know but three games out of 32 like that's not that's not gonna cut it um either you look to move Wiggins or you look to move Thompson while you can, while you can still do it. Um, yeah. And I think more likely they're going to keep Thompson. So it's yeah, like now, now, now make the decision to, you know what, let's move, let's move someone like Andrew Wiggins or, uh, you know, trade him and add a package deal to it. You know, we'll, we'll trade you Wiggins and we'll add maybe like someone like Moses Moody in there, you know, to make the, the deal better. And then you add a pick, maybe add a draft pick in there, and then you start. Hey, we need to get because they need to do something yeah. because it's not working. Nothing's working. I mean, you're you're 32 games into the year now. Like, it things should be clicking by now. Like, you're almost you're literally almost halfway through the year. You're you're almost halfway through the season, and and I feel like waiting until waiting until February to make a move. Like, that's not that's not gonna cut it, dude. Like, they need to do it now. Um, it looks like Chris, well, no, yeah, Chris Paul played, but Chris Paul is doing his thing, you know, like, I mean, he's never really scored a whole lot of points, nine points, but four assists, four rebounds, like, I, I guess that's kind of low, but for the most part, he's been pretty consistent, you know, for the most part, I feel like yeah. you don't move him, you know, um, uh, I like the asset of having Chris Paul because it gives players like Steph Curry more to run around the court and, and get open, you know, um. And we well, thought that, that he's just, he's a good leader for that that bench. Yeah, he's, he's like, a perfect leader, a perfect veteran. Um, and like I said, like we thought that it was gonna help get Clay Thompson more comfortable and get him more open shots. And there's time like Clay Thompson's open, he's just not he's just not making him, dude. And it's mm -hmm. it's ridiculous at this point, you know. And it's frustrating as a Warrior fan. It's it's very frustrating uh, watching him play because you're like, we never when he came back from his ACL injury. We never, or it's ACL and his Achilles, excuse me, we didn't expect him to be the same player he was because those are pretty traumatic injuries to come back from and to be, and expected, and expecting him to be the same player that he once was, like, we're, I wasn't expecting that. I know, like, some other fans were probably expecting him to be that, but I wasn't expecting him to be that player that he was, but yeah. I did expect him to still be a person that can knock down shots, you know, and he's not knocking down shots. He's, he's missing a lot of open shots. So it's frustrating. And yeah. if you're, and if you're a, a GM, like you have to start, you have to start thinking about, okay, you know what? Like Steph maybe has like maybe anywhere between three to five more good years left mm -hmm. in him. Do you really want to waste that? Because you're so hell bent on, I want to keep the splash brothers together. No, like you need to start thinking ahead. Like, Okay, like with, let's not. Uh, we don't want to get Steph Curry to the point to where he's, where he's fush, where he gets frustrated, and becomes frustrated because he wants to win, and now he ends up wanting to maybe demand a trade out of there, or after his next contract's up, like, you know, ends up leaving because the Warriors aren't doing crap. You know, like yeah. I know he's pretty dedicated and wants to retire there, but how many times have we heard players say this is where I want to retire, and then like LeBron when. He he went back to Cleveland like he was I, I remember hearing about it too like he wants to retire as a Cavalier mm -hmm. what happened he went to the Lakers he's saying he wants to retire as a Laker he he's more than likely not going to retire a Laker you know he might go back to Cleveland or he might go somewhere else and play so it's you, yeah. you, can, you can never really trust anything these guys say like you know it's I mean I know he wants to stay there but I, and I think he will if they can put pieces around him to help them still compete for championships you know um, because he wants to win and I, I know he wants to at least win one more. I know he does. Yeah. So if not two, to tie the great Michael Jordan. So, um, yeah, that, that's kind of my my take on that. No, I agree. You can't you can't go from beating beating the number one team in Boston Celtics and and almost beating the Denver Nuggets to falling to a team like the Miami Heat. Uh, that's just inexcusable. And your top top scorers were the Splash Brothers, and they had a a lowly 13 points a piece. Um, and they had no, no help from anybody else. Um, if you look at, like you said, Wiggins, Wiggins only produced 11 points. 
um, that matched Moses Moody and uh, Com and almost Kaminga, which I, I feel Kaminga and Moses Moody have been playing way better than Andrew Wiggins. Um, I, I agree, though, that there's a player to move because they're not going to move Thompson. I, I, I yeah. doubt that they would they would move they would move Wiggins before anybody. Uh, they already moved him to the bench. So, I mean, like at that point, it's like the next step is he's probably out of there. Uh, you might, like you said, get something, get something out of him while you still can, and you need to do it way before the trade deadline because at that point, like how far, how how far are you gonna fall in the records? You you still want to keep in that contention, you know what I mean? Um, and another thing, they are they are missing Draymond in these like these big games, like you said, like had they had Draymond for Denver, he could have been a guy to get into Jokic's head. And that could have been probably, you know, an X factor for that game. They probably would have pulled it off. But, yeah, if there's a player to move or players to move, you might want to – it'd be Wiggins. You might have to move Moses Moody. Um, I like Kaminga, but, like, if you can get something for those three, like something big, like do it, you know, do it while you still can. Because, like you said, you don't, you don't want to waste Steph's years. He's, he's still – like at his age, the way he's playing is just—it's remarkable. Um, this guy can easily get another ring or two. Yeah. You just need—you need some key pieces around them. They and they have—they have the best freaking bench in the league right now. It's just their starters that are not producing, which is—it's. You only got one, see. one starter producing anything, you know. And like I said, yeah, exactly. he's gonna have a bad night at some point. Yeah. It's, it's he's human, you know. He's not—he's not not human. He's gonna have off night so exactly but yeah it's, it's it's being wasted right now and yeah eventually that's going to lead to some fr frustration but i i mean i do i i see them i see them making some moves though. um i just don't know who's going to move <laughs> but i do i do see them trying to get something they're probably talking about it right now as we speak but yeah they i mean hopefully. they gotta do something because i mean when you look at it dude this thing can get ugly for golden state real quick um yeah. i was i was assuming like that they would probably beat miami tonight you know um and get back on that win on because they have like the next seven games home like i thought they yeah. could have at least won at least four or five of those games on a home stretch but when you look at the schedule now after losing to miami you're like well damn you got to play the mavericks now next who are currently number six in the league but literally like only like one game back from they're like one game behind from like the number four seed and like two games back behind the third seed and then when you look at they, they got to play dallas they got to play the uh orlando magic as well which the magic aren't bad this year like they're actually doing a lot better than i than i had them ever being you know uh yeah i, mean, I had them i had them not even making the bubble, like not even making the play-in tournament, you know. Uh, but they look promising. They're young, um, and they're they're a feisty little group, you know. Uh, and then after that, they got to play the Denver Nuggets again. Like it's this thing can get ugly. They can literally drop from eleven to what is it like? like damn, dude. I mean, they they can they could drop from eleven to thirteen, eleven to thirteen. Yeah. Like I mean, and that's like. Now you're talking about being three or four games back behind the number the even in the in the play in. So um, I mean they gotta get it figured out. And like I said, they don't have Draymond. Like this is and this is what I'm saying. It, it's hurting. It's hurting them right now that they don't have Draymond. Yeah. Um, and Draymond has to see that dude. Like he has to see it. You know. Um, and they're missing him on the court. You know they get a break against the the Pistons, but then they gotta play like the Raptors, Pelicans. Bulls, who literally, for some reason, they play, play good against some of the great teams, but then lose to the team that they shouldn't even be losing to. So who's to say that they won't even beat us? And then we got to play the Bucks, Grizzlies. Still got to play Dallas in like three weeks, two weeks later. And you got the Hawks and the Kings. Like this team can get nasty real quick if they're not careful. Um, you, know, you look at that uh, Grizzlies game, and you're like, you know, a couple weeks ago, you're like, uh, you know, that that's the team you can beat. But right now, they got John John Morant back, and he's like, he's on fire right now. I think he's like four and zero since he's been back. Yeah, right? I mean, they they, they, but, literally, they literally went from being the uh, uh, number, I think almost like I think they were like tied at 15, and now they're climbing the rankings at 13, and they're only they're only five games back behind the Warriors. Like, 
And like I'm saying, like the Warriors can literally drop all the way down to 13 because of who their of who their next coming up upcoming opponents are. You know, like mm-hmm. like I said, like they're they're five games back. Dallas, Magic, Denver. They might be they might beat the the uh, the Pistons, the Raptors, Pelicans, Bulls, Bucks, and then the Grizzlies. Like by the time they play the Grizzlies, like the Grizzlies might be up there with us. You know, and then like. Like I said, after that, they still got to play Dallas again, the the Hawks, Kings, 76ers, Grizzlies again. Like, it it doesn't get easier yeah. until almost like, like the after the first week of February is when it gets kind of easy again. But, I mean, by then it could be too late. Like, I feel like they need to make a move and they need to, they need to do something now. Yeah. No, yeah, that, that'd be way too deep into the season. That's like – like towards the All Star, All Star game, and then you know, I mean, the All Star break. That's that's when, um, that's when you start to see like where where teams are. Like you're like, okay, these teams are gonna make it, and then you have those teams that are, you know, they're gonna have to like right. hit the floor running, and then you have the teams that are just you're like, okay, they're just not even in contention. So, yeah, we want to try to get <laughs> out of that spot where you're in that like gray area where you're not even in the playing. Mm-hmm. You you still want to be like at least in that top 10 still, you know, where you still have a chance. Yeah, and right now they, they look like they're a team that might not even make the freaking play. And that sucks because what's one thing that the Warriors has never really – even, like, throughout, throughout their, their championship runs, like, they've, they've always had, like, the the death lineup. Like, they, they had, like, team, like, players like Kevin Durant on a team. And, like, they only really had, like, like two good – players coming off the bench, you know, like yeah. rather it would have been like Sean Livingston and Iguodala or it was Livingston and uh, uh, Barbosa, like, mm-hmm. you know, like you always had like a good, like two good players that would come off the bench. Yeah. And like as now the Warriors, like it's kind of like reverse, like it's almost like your your bench is better than your first five. It's like, yeah. do you yeah. make the That's adjustment crazy. and start everyone on your bench with Steph and then bring other guys off the bench, like players like Clay Tom, like you got to do something, you know? Mm-hmm. Um that or you just got to start making moves. And I know they're not going to move Clay Thompson. Like, that's that's just something. Like, I, although I think they probably should. Or maybe even not so much move him, but, you know, hey, he's got to take the role of the sixth man. Like, he's not a starter anymore. And he, I feel like he has to kind of start uh, seeing that, you know. Like, mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with it. Some of the greats that yeah. – some of the greats came off, off the bench late in their career. Ray Allen was one of them. You know, Ray Allen was a starter – almost his entire career until he got to his later, I think it was like his later years in Boston. And then yeah. definitely when he went to Miami, he wasn't in the starting lineup, you know? Uh, Shane uh, Battier. Shane Battier, Mike Miller. Uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty of players out there. Uh, Jamal Cropper was another one. Like, yeah, Jamal Carter, he, was, he was real good in his, in his career. Yeah. And he came off the bench late in his career. So it's just, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. And I don't know, I, I know, it's just like a pride thing, and I get it. But you got to put your pride aside and think what's best in interest for the team. And if the best interest is coming off the bench, like there's nothing wrong with it, dude. Like you're still gonna you're still gonna play a lot, you know. Like even when yeah. players like Ray Allen came off the bench, it was he still played a little bit more than half the game, you know. Like it was he had a lot of minutes, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, I just think that's something that he needs to start realizing, but he's not, you know. Whenever they tell him like. What do you want me to come off the bench? He just kind of laughs at it, and it's like, dude, you got to think what's best. And right now, what's best is probably you coming off the bench and letting someone else take in that take in that starting role. You know, so mm-hmm. that that's kind of my take on that. Um, but they definitely got to make a move at some point, whether it's moving Wiggins, because and I always said like I like Wiggs, but and he helped us win another championship. He was a big reason why we won it. He could have easily been a Finals MVP. Um, yep. that year that they won it because it was kind of like a debate, you know. Um, but now it's like I always say, like Wiggins could have been one of those players that could have been a great player, but he didn't. He didn't really take a lot of things serious in his career, you know. He was just you could tell he wanted that he didn't want to be that leader because when Minnesota drafted him, they expected him to be that leader. When he was in Kansas, he wasn't that leader. Um, with the Timberwolves, he wasn't that leader. Like you know, just. And that that was kind of a big reason why they got rid of him in Cleveland too, like when they traded him away. So yeah, um, and same thing with like the Warriors. Like he came in, he didn't have to be a leader, but he still had a big role. 
and now it's kind of like, you know, he's, I think it's time to move on from him now. Like he did his time there in Golden State and you got to start thinking in long terms of career for Steph, in my opinion. Like you just, you don't want to waste these next two or three years that he has left, great years that he has left into him before he starts slowing down. Yeah, no, no, I definitely agree. Do it before it's too late. Yeah. So that wraps up the NFR episode today. Thank you guys for joining us, and please go to our Elite Film Production YouTube channel and watch our other undeniable podcasts. And we're going to be live Monday and Thursday on Instagram at 9 (laughs) o'clock. Yes, we appreciate all you guys coming in. Um, I believe uh, only one, only one, one person messaged me on uh, our DMs to see if they won, that they won their raffle. So uh, we will have to do. Uh, let me check real quick, um, just to double check. I want to make sure that no one else sent me a message on their uh, on their little raffle that they won so let me just double check really quick um yeah so we still have to do one more raffle because uh yeah i I have to do at least one more uh, one more raffle because only one person got back to me so we're gonna do one more raffle right now for (laughs) the end of it so we're gonna see who wins um, who was the first person that won it was uh Oh yeah, Diego got back to me. Okay, so let's see. And the next winner is going to be Catalina Martinez. So that's who it'll be Diego and Catalina Martinez who end up getting our signed hat and uh the gift card. So we appreciate you guys participating and I'll send you guys and guys a message in a little bit, okay? Um but with that being said, we will see you guys on uh our next episode, which will be our 41th episode tonight, was fun. We had professional basketball Dylan Ababu, uh, who we got to interview tonight. We appreciate him coming on. Um, we did our raffle, and it's always great being here with you guys every night. So, mm-hmm. Chris, sure, I'll leave it sure. to you to close the show. <laughs> uh, oh, it's, it's been a it's been a fun fun journey so far. Thank you guys for uh, tuning in, supporting. Uh, we appreciate it and. We look forward to many more shows. Yes, yes, absolutely. Appreciate you guys, and we will see you guys on our next episode of Undeniable. You guys have a great night. Good night. Bye, guys. Bye.